Okay, members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee. And uh, if there's any declarations of financial or relevant interests related to any business uh, on today's agenda, now is the appropriate time to uh, declare that. Um, if not, then we shall move on. Um, if members are agreeable, we'll have the oral evidence sessions and will be reported by Hansard. Um, so, just to inform members, uh, Leanne, who you will be familiar with um, in terms of uh, the committee staff, uh, will be leaving the Assembly um, and uh, the Justice Committee next week. And I just want to put on record my appreciation for the work that she has carried out um, on behalf of all of us on the committee. Um, she was a very diligent member of the team, uh, and I know uh, members thought very highly of her. So. Uh, we do wish her uh, every success in her new job. Um, on that then, members, can I welcome uh, Clarita Fraser, who is uh, joining us today for this meeting. Um, a very experienced assistant clerk um, uh, has joined to support the work of this committee, and uh, you're very welcome to the, to the Justice Committee team. We're an easy enough bunch to get on with, so there'll be no problems there. We've uh, no apologies for many members. Um, we're joined uh, on Starleaf by Linda Dillon, Gemma Dolan, Emma Rogan, Rachel Woods, Doug Beatty, Shania Bradley and Gordon Dunn. And uh, there has been no delegation of uh, votes. So item two on the agenda is the draft minutes of the meeting that were held on the 4th of February. And if members are content that they're a true reflection of proceedings, then I will sign them accordingly. Members content? Okay. Agreed. Agreed. Um, one uh, matter arising, there's a response from the Minister of Justice to the Committee's letter on the damages bill um, and the issue around accelerated passage. That was received yesterday um, from the Minister to the Committee in response to the Committee's letter um, that had been sent um, following the oral evidence session on the 28th of January. Um, so, members, it's there. Uh, for noting, we'll put it back on the agenda for next week, um, at which point we may have an update from today's executive meeting, and then we can deal with that issue um, at next week's uh, meeting. Okay, item four then is the Criminal Justice uh, Committal Reform Bill, the oral evidence session with the Law Society. Um, there's representatives then of the Law Society for Northern Ireland. They're attending the meeting via the Starleaf facility. Uh, a copy of the written submission. Uh, is included in pages 12 to 21 of your meeting pack and the Hansard of the oral evidence session with representatives of the Bar of Northern Ireland is included in your tabled pack, pages 16 to 29. So can I welcome uh, Pierce McDermott and uh, Owen uh, McKenna who are representing the uh, Law Society for Northern Ireland to the meeting. Um, the session will be reported by Hansard and then a transcript will be published on the committee web page. So if I can hand over uh, to yourselves to provide uh, an outline, uh, a brief outline of the key issues in respect of the provisions of the bill and then uh, members will move into a question and answer session uh, with you. So thank you. Thank you Mr Chairman, that's Pierce McDermott here. I intend to make a few remarks. Um, we intend to keep our submissions brief in this matter today, as we are aware the committee has already had the benefit of our written submissions and also aware the committee heard evidence from the Bar Council last week, which would touch upon the same issues. I are also fully aware that the committee is very familiar with the process that the committal process that we've been talking about. It appears to us that the bill has two clear objectives, namely one, to abolish all physical evidence in court in advance of a trial, and secondly, to introduce direct transfers to the Crown Court in all indictable cases. The rationale from the Department of Justice appears to be threefold in addition to this. Firstly, the Department would say that this will reduce delay in criminal cases. Secondly, they would say that it will reduce costs. And thirdly, they say that it will prevent witnesses from having to give evidence on more than one occasion. We believe that the current proposals contained in the bill before the Justice Committee will not actually have the desired effects as mentioned by the Department. At present, the process is that the prosecution prepare a bundle of papers called committal or PE papers which contains all of the evidence relied on by the prosecution, and they, there, they then serve that on the defence. The matter is then listed before the magistrate's court, and at that stage, a legally qualified magistrate examines the papers to consider whether or not there's a prima facie case to return the case to the Crown Court. It is also at that stage that witnesses can be called if the magistrate believes it's in the interest of justice. It's this point that the, that the said judicial qualified judge decides on the strength of the prosecution case as to whether it should proceed to the Crown Court or not. We submit this, this is a very important filter in the criminal justice process 
which allows those cases in which the person case is either weak or flawed to be filtered out of the system, making a trial and the costs of a trial and the delay in a trial unnecessary. Therefore, we in fact say that rather than creating delay, the acquittal process reduces delay in that it allows those cases which should never proceed to trial to be taken out of the justice system without that delay and without expensive cost of having to go to a Crown Court trial. We would point out that there is a major distinction made between the process in Northern Ireland and other jurisdictions such as England and Wales. And that distinction is that our magistrates' courts are staffed by legally qualified judges who are in a position to make rational legal decisions based on the evidence before them. So what we therefore say is that rather than increasing delay in criminal cases, we believe the committal process reduces delay in a number of cases by taking them out of the system. Further, the Department of Justice would have the committee believe that the removal of committal proceedings will somehow be a panacea in removing delay in criminal cases. The Minister herself has mentioned this on recent occasions. We would submit, as have the Bar Council, that the main cause of delay in criminal cases is in the investigation stage. From an incident occurring to a set of P or committal papers being prepared, the main delay occurs in the police gathering of evidence. The police have to obtain witness statements. They have to seek forensic evidence very often in many cases. They have to examine telephones. They have to examine computers. They have to examine CCTV. And as a committee will be well aware, all of these matters take considerable time and resources. This is a major cause of delay in the criminal justice process. And this has been acknowledged by most parties involved in the system, including the judiciary. What we would support would be the placing of more resources into the investigative stage of the case and the use of strict time limits to be imposed by any supervisory judge. The current committal process allows a legally qualified judge to keep a supervisory view on a case and to progress it as quick as possible by putting pressure on the PPS and the police when necessary to obtain whatever reports are necessary to move the case forward. The removal of the committal process will merely put this supervisory role onto the lap of a Crown Court judge and will have the, they will have the same powers and the same supervisory jurisdiction and therefore it won't result in any reduction in delay but in fact will just transfer that from a magistrate to a Crown Court judge. If we now turn to the issue of costs, it is very unclear from the current bill before the committee as to what process the DOJ intends to put in place instead of criminal proceedings. They refer to direct transfer, but they don't indicate when this will take place. Will it be at the start of the case? Will it be on charging? Will it be when all the documents are gathered? Will it be the end of a magistrate's court? It's very hard to say what they intend at this point in time. We believe that's something the committee should take up with the department. At the present time, a case can run for a number of months, in fact, up to a number of years in many cases, pending the preparation of all of the prosecution papers. This will happen whether it's in the magistrate's court or whether it's in the Crown Court. This is the process I've talked about earlier, the investigative process. It should be pointed out to the committee that the length of time that a case takes to progress to committal does not impact in any way on the remuneration offered to lawyers in the case. There's a fixed composite fee for these cases. Hey, Peter. <clears throat> Peter, sorry, we're just having slight technical difficulty there. Um, so, Pierce will maybe join us shortly. Um, I think that is, he's maybe trying to get back into the, the call. We'll just give it a moment here, see if Pierce can come back. That's you back. Yeah. Apologies, uh, the wonders of modern technology. It's a way know. to do business, but unfortunately, it's, it's a modern way. Well, uh, I, I had turned to the issue of cost. I'm not sure if, how much of that you'd got. We had missed that slightly. Now, at least you didn't turn into a cat. So that that's. <laughs> I, I was I was nearly there. There is of course the famous Mousy McDermott lawyer in, in Family Guy, but that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, sorry, uh, we, we missed it. We we had just got you. You had mentioned that. Um, there's a composite fee, so therefore that, that, yeah. that's pretty much where we had got to. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Yeah, as I say, there's a, there's a composite fee in place, so the longer a case takes, the less economically viable it actually becomes for the lawyer. There's a myth out there that defence lawyers drag out cases in order to make more money, and this is just simply incorrect. 
The standard fee is payable irrespective of how quickly or how long a case takes to get progressed in the Magistrates Court. Uh, if we now turn to the detail of the proposed process for direct transfer to see whether or not it will involve any increase in costs, uh, it's hard to say at this point in time because we haven't actually seen how the process works or the proposed process works. What we can say is that the current system, which allows for a filtering out of the number of cases at an early stage in the Magistrates Court, clearly results in a reduction in costs and reduction in time spent in court, reduction in delay. Those are cases which never progress to trial and don't have to be involved in further costs and further time spent by a Crown Court judge. The third rationale of the Department seems to be the issue of witnesses having to give evidence on more than one occasion. And we acknowledge that there is currently a mood abroad, both generally and in the political society, that witnesses and victims should be protected as much as possible, and we support that, and we've always supported all measures taken to do that. At the present time, there's currently a system in the justice system which allows witnesses to have special measures when giving evidence. This allows them to do such things as give their evidence by video, from behind screens, or in the absence of a defendant. And while we acknowledge that witnesses are entitled to be protected, we clearly state that this should in no way undermine the right of a person accused of a serious criminal matter to challenge that evidence against them. It's a fundamental tenet of the justice system that a person accused of very serious crime should be entitled to challenge the evidence against them at the earliest possible stage. We believe that the removal of committal proceedings could interfere with the defendant's Article 6 right to a fair trial at an early stage. We appreciate that these are competing interests, and we appreciate that these are difficult questions to decide, but we believe that a person who is facing serious charges and facing criminal offences and possibly a period of time in custody is entitled to have their rights exercised fully. Further, we would wish the committee to note that witnesses who are giving evidence at a committal stage are not always what would be called victims. Some are uh, identifying witnesses, some are police officers, and some are witnesses giving evidence in a chain of events. The ability of a court to assess a witness evidence at an early stage, given all the protections that are afforded to that witness, is a very important stage in allowing the court to assess whether or not that witness could be mistaken or even dishonest. As the committee will well be aware, many honest witnesses can be mistaken, and the sooner those mistakes are highlighted to a court, the better for the justice system. We do acknowledge that some progress has been made by the Department in progressing cases faster through the system. There's a recent pilot scheme which meant to just to allow defendants who wish to plead guilty to fast track those cases without having to obtain all the necessary paperwork and reports. We believe that this is a very useful tool and can avoid long delays in waiting on forensic evidence, on drugs analysis, or on phone analysis. And we believe the system can well satisfy a twin tracked approach to allow both for a speedy return to the Crown Court for those cases in which the defendant tends to plead guilty, and also one which allows a legally qualified magistrate to supervise and assess the evidence against the defendant. It should also be noted that committal proceedings are a very useful tool in focusing the minds of both the prosecution and the defence on how best to progress a case. It's very often at this stage that both lawyers and both sides get involved and discuss how, how best to progress the case. We are very unclear at this stage as to how a direct transfer process would work, but we believe that the focus at an early stage of both parties on the evidence of the case leads to a, a reduction in delay. In short, we would submit that the removal of the ability to call witnesses at a PI, which is a committal stage, and the imposition of direct transfer in all indictable cases is the wrong approach to be taken by the Department to try and reduce delay or protect witnesses. We make no apology for saying that a defendant should be allowed to challenge evidence at the earliest possible stage, and in this jurisdiction, at this present time, this means at the Magistrates' Court during committal proceedings. We don't believe that the current proposal will reduce the delay in cases, which we have already said mostly takes place at the investigation stage, or reduce costs. We further don't believe it will protect any witnesses any more than the current system does. The Law Society understands the importance of a person's Article 6 right to a fair trial and also understands the importance of the legal principle that the prosecution must prove their case to a certain standard. The Committee may, may comment and do note that, a number of cases not returned, that the number of cases not returned to Crown Court at that stage is relatively small. The most recent figures appear to say about 4% in any given year. On the last year that we can find, which was 2019, 4% of those cases returned to Crown Court would be 72 cases. And while it would be easy to sit in isolation and say that's a very small number, if you are one of the 72 people who have been wrongly brought before a court for a very serious charge, you would wish to have the opportunity to have that case dismissed at the very earliest possible opportunity. So we say it's a very important function. We believe that the current interest of justice test embodied in the 2015 Act protects the rights of all parties and allows the justice system to speedily deal with those cases which should not be in the system in the first place. The new bill does not achieve the stated aims of reducing delay, 
and the rights of a defendant, who we would stress is innocent until proven guilty, should be protected. We're happy to take any questions from the committee now. Uh, Pierce, thank, thank you for that and um, for your written submission. And, and there's a lot of very good information in there when I was reading through it. Um, and the point that you've made there about the 4% in the 72 cases, uh, the, you, you highlight in the written submission around the um, kind of 4%, but you, you highlight that um, my reading of it was that there's a lot of cases that could have been considered for preliminary inquiry maybe didn't happen. Is, is, is that my reading of this? Is this, is this a, a process which is being underutilised, which if it was utilised more extensively um, would maybe generate different statistics? Yes, I think, I think you might have a point there, uh, Mr Chairman. The, the issue it seems to be that a lot of lawyers don't. Because of, over the years the threshold for returning someone through the magistrate's court has, has been remained quite low, um, any prima facie evidence will get returned. A lot of lawyers don't use it as a, as a method of challenging the evidence, but certainly we would submit and we believe that if it was overutilised, or if it was usually utilised more, I should say, not overutilised, utilised more, then those figures may well go up. Because once you actually scrutinise a case in any depth, uh, and a judge has a chance to look at it, a lot of cases we believe, which, which will result in an acquittal at the Crown Court, could well have been uh, dismissed at an earlier stage of the proceedings. Yeah. And, and your point's well made around the Article 6 uh, uh, and defendants. Uh, and I suppose one of my questions in considering this, that yes, defendants have, have a right, um, but I, I'm also trying to put myself in a victim's shoe, whereby what, what, what is more traumatic, um, having a case potentially dismissed at a preliminary inquiry or going through a full court case where you know, we know that it's, it's beyond unreasonable doubt at that stage as opposed to establishing a prima facie case. Um, one could argue it's actually worse for victims to have went through a lengthy Crown Court case uh, to then not have a successful outcome. Well, I, I find myself agreeing with you again, uh, which is unusual. Uh, we've been twice now. Yet we also believe that um, the process, it's really down to the, the standard of the prosecution case and the nature of the evidence to be given by a witness. If a witness isn't to be believed in a Crown Court trial, or, or if a witness is mistaken in a Crown Court trial, or a victim is mistaken or unbelieved, if this takes place at an earlier stage, it may well be that it, it is in the victim's interest or the witness's interest to have this matter dealt with earlier and without having to go through the entire process and the longer delays in getting to the Crown Court. So yes, we would, we would echo your views that this, this process, if used properly, can be an effective method for both protecting defendants and also for bringing closure, if that's the right way of putting it, to uh, witnesses and victims. Yeah. Um... Just in terms of then that Article 6 argument, um, and I suppose in considering that there isn't maybe a lot of preliminary inquiries, how intrinsic is the, this form of committal process to upholding those Article 6 rights? You know, would, would that be in breach by removing um, these preliminary inquiry type processes out of committal process? Um, the Article 6 right, is, as the committee will know, allows a person to have a fair trial and part of that uh, encompasses allowing them to have a speedy trial. I have to say that given the length of time um, that even the most complex case takes to get to committal stage, I wouldn't think that the European Court would hold the removal of committal proceedings uh, would result in a breach of Article 6 potentially, and only in the most extreme cases potentially. Uh, the time limits allowed by Article 6 um, by the Court's jurisprudence in Article 6 are quite extensive. so. My own view is that if the removal of the committal proceeding would not result in a successful challenge on an Article 6 basis to a case not progressing. And obviously, you have your rights protected by having a Crown Court trial in due course, but um, I wouldn't go as far as to say that the removal would be an automatic breach. I would say that we should err on the side of caution, and we should err on the side of the defendant's rights to have a speedy resolution of his case, his or her case, rather than waiting to a Crown Court trial. Okay, um, and then on that speedy comment, uh, I noted from the submission, um, you had provided some data, I just don't have it in front of me, but I think it was from 2015-16, uh, an average of 166 days, and it's now, the most recent figures, 110 or 111 days. Um, so in that context, part of the basis for this is to speed up the delays, uh, and that's what I want to try and figure out that if the policy position here is to speed up um, the court's processes, will it actually achieve that? 
Well, that, that I think it's fair for Marshall Mitchell, we don't believe it will. Um, the, uh, the, main, the main thrust of, of delay in the criminal justice system is in the investigation stage, and, and I know this is something you've heard time and time again, but the difficulty is that it, it's in relation to, particularly in relation to those cases which require forensic analysis of uh, drugs, for instance, forensic analysis of computers, forensic analysis of phones. There's a major, major backlog in getting those items identified and those items triaged and checked for for uh, material which can be of use to the prosecution. That's where the delay arises. We don't believe that the the, abol the abolishing of the committal proceeding will increase this speed. We believe that basically all it will do is kick it further down the road. It means that the Crown Court will have to deal with the issues of delay at the, pre at the present time being dealt with by the Magistrates Court. So the same time frame will still take place. Uh, the, the, the time between a set of papers being served on a defence solicitor and a committal proceeding taking place, even by way of challenging evidence, is not very long. It's a matter of weeks. Um, the delay really is in the preparation of the prosecution case and getting a date in Crown Court trial then. The committal process itself uh, is not very, doesn't take very long at all to get set up from the papers being sent. So we believe that this doesn't remedy the major delays that are in the system. Okay, and in moving it from the Magistrate Court into the Crown Court, uh, is there then, uh, in terms of that delay, potential increase in costs? Um, at the minute, we don't know what the Department's proposal is for the actual the actual legislation which will return somebody to the Crown Court, whether it is from on first charging. In England, for instance, you appear in the Magistrates Court and then you go straight to the Crown Court. We don't know if that's the proposal, or is it a case to gather the paperwork in the Magistrates Court and then have a direct transfer uh, at a later stage? So we're unclear. But, but it certainly could increase costs in the sense of um, if you're having to review cases on a regular basis in the Crown Court, there are increased costs in having a Crown Court judge and two sets of lawyers involved in that stage, while in the magistrate's court, it's, it's usually only the solicitor and the magistrate that would deal with it. So there's potential to increase cost if it's a direct transfer. Okay. And in terms of the, 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 the district judges in the magistrates, and I picked up on your paper, you know, the, the benefit of having that judicial oversight in terms of looking at the evidence, um, how, how widespread of a view would it be within you know, district judges in terms of the feedback that they're given to defence solicitors that this is a process that they think should be retained? Would that be wi widely held in your view? Do you want the honest answer? <laughs> Always. Uh, no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. Uh, district judges don't like preliminary investigations, don't like um, committal proceedings particularly. Uh, and there's a very simple rationale. They take time. Um, if you're bringing a witness before a, a district judge's court, the witness's evidence has to be transcribed, um, which takes time in a, in a committal process. And like everybody in, in life, district judges are, are happier to take the easy way out than if they can knock it down the road to a Crown Court judge and happen to do that. So I would I'd be wrong to say that district judges will be keen to retain committal proceedings. But um, the importance isn't so much that whether they do or do, do not want to keep them. The importance is that they're legally qualified and in a possessed person to assess the evidence and make a, a, a legal decision on whether there's sufficient evidence to turn someone to the Crown Court. Okay, and I think that is an important point, you know, at, at that stage of the process that you have that judicial oversight of it um, before it goes into the Crown Court. Okay, listen, let me thank you for, for answering those questions for me. There may be a couple that I, I'll want to come back on, but I, I'm keen to bring other members in that are, are waiting to do that. So if I can bring in uh, Sinead Bradley and then Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation, Pierce, um, so far. It does concern me, uh, Pierce, because you've said that you're not fully aware of the proposal that's being made by the Department, and that's not the first time we've heard that. Is it because there's no clarity in the proposal as it's being presented to you, or you know, what is the problem there? It's a fine detail. Basically, the proposal is, is relatively clear in the sense of they wish to get rid of calling witnesses uh, at this for at this first stage, and the second stage is they wish to have all the indictable matters returned, direct transfer to the Crown Court, which means you don't have a capital process. So that principle is fairly clear. What isn't clear is the mechanics of that, and is the nitty gritty, is the detail, is it at what point in time does that happen? Because just to talk you through it very briefly, at the minute somebody gets charged with an offence, say, say a very serious matter, like a, a murder. They appear in court tomorrow morning, charged with that murder. Uh, that case then stays in the magistrate's court until such times as the prosecution have gathered up all the paperwork and all the material in which they intend to rely. 
They then serve the papers on the, on the defence and they then have the committal process. Um, what is unclear is, do, they, do the department mean that tomorrow morning when the person appears in front of the magistrate's court, it automatically gets transferred to the Crown Court, the date set for that? Or do they mean that the same process takes place to gather all the evidence, which can take months, but then at the end stage when the prosecution gather all the evidence, they then press a button saying direct transfer, which doesn't have a, a committal process. We just don't know how, how the process is intended to work. And because of that lack of knowledge, it's very difficult to talk about the cost because we don't know at what stage we're getting moved to the Crown Court or how we get moved to the Crown Court. So that's, that's, the, the, the principle is clear, but it's, a, it's the actual practical process is very unclear. Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks, Pierce. And, and that brings me on then to, uh, just for clarity, going over the costs again, you were saying that it's a set, um, a set fee. So at what point does that, does that trigger? You know, what, what is that payment? How does that work? Just a wee bit more detail on that, please, Pierce. Okay. Um, well, usually in any criminal matter where somebody appears in court, the judge will decide whether their means are such and the offence is such that they're entitled to be granted legal aid. So that's legally is granted at that point. If a case is going to the Crown Court, at the committal stage, which is what we're talking about now, the person is returned to the Crown Court and the lawyer can then claim a fee for that. And that's a composite fee, whether that takes place in four weeks' time, whether that mm -hmm. takes place in six months' time, or whether that takes place in two years' time. It's the same fee, irrespective. And what you have to understand is in that period of time, so say, for instance, we're sitting waiting six months, that defendant will be in court every four weeks who's in custody, or every six weeks or so if they're on bail. And the lawyer will have to appear on every occasion. So in one sense, it's a law of diminishing returns for the lawyer. The less time in court, the better. But it's the same fee, irrespective of how quickly it gets returned or how long it takes. Right, so the proposal would be to just cancel that fee altogether? That wouldn't we, be part of it? I don't know. That's, that's, again, part of the fine detail which we're unaware of. Okay, and and another reoccurring um, event. You know, I, I it's not adding up to me. I'll be honest, Pierce. In terms of that one objective, um, I, I get the pace. You know, where we're trying to make the experience for victims um, a much more comfortable one, if that's possible. But the part about speeding up the justice system, um, if the same processes have to be gone through, it doesn't really matter what headings on it. As far as I'm concerned, if those um, processes are problematic. Is there anywhere, or do you have any paper that maybe even in the past where you've looked at identifying what those very real day-to-day -day obstacles are in the process that slow it down? And do you have any constructive maybe solutions or ideas to bring forward on how that can be improved? Because I don't understand, you know, we talk about the telephones and, and going down that What's happening there? Why is that so slow? Is it resource? Is it manpower? What's the problem? Uh, unfortunately, as as the the, uh, the assembly will be, we're well aware, resources are the big issue. Um, resources are the big issue in all of these matters. What you will hear on a regular basis, if you appear in the magistrate's court for cases going to the crown court, the judge will say, "What's the progress in this case?" Uh, the prosecution will say, well, "We're awaiting a forensic report in relation to footprints, in relation to DNA, in relation to." Uh, a phone which has been seized or a computer it can take literally can take over a year to get a phone uh, completely analyzed and um, because it's quite an expert and difficult thing to do so it's resources that main issue that is where the real delay in these cases lies i mean the, the committal itself is a, a standard committal is a, a five minute hearing in court if i'm served with papers and i appear for a committal tomorrow uh, in fact i did one yesterday which was just the client arrived in and the charge was read to him returned it was five minutes it took that in that case okay so the committal itself does not slow the process um we have yet to see any evidence from the department as to how their proposal to get rid of committals will and will speed up the system because the delay doesn't lie the delay doesn't lie in actual in that process the delay lies in getting all the evidence before the for the prosecution so they can give it to the defense that's where the delay lies in the investigation side and say so we would support certainly any um increased resources obviously it's a finite pull out there and, and you can't just throw money at it but it, the problem is that the forensic science agency is under extreme pressure um, and the police force under extreme pressure and that is where the delay lies in getting the resources and getting what the statements getting all the material through as as regards to constructive um uh, we certainly would work with the department and we have worked with the department in addition to those cases for instance which I've, I've talked about in my in my opening remarks where a defendant basically is knows he's guilty of the offence, is happy he's guilty of the offence and wants to get his case sentenced. And there is a fast track approach which you can then say, we don't need those reports, we're happy to accept that. Mm -hmm. And then the prosecution can prepare a, a, a reduced down file, which will then speed things up. 
But again, that doesn't impact upon committal. That impacts upon... Okay, and just finally, one, one last point, and I don't even know if there is a valid question. If there is any such thing as a, an average fee that would be paid to a lawyer on a committal process, what would that look like or what would that be? I mean, you're not allowed to ask about money. You know that. Come on. <laughs> Roughly, uh, I just... It, we, it's, we're it's, it's, um, it's, fully avail it's fully available on the, on the legal service agency site. The fee paid to a lawyer for committal, whether it lasts for one week or whether it lasts for two years, is £820. Okay. And that can encompass 25 appearances in the Magistrates Court. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Pierce. Thanks for that answer. Okay, thank you, Sinead. So um, I'm going to bring in Linda Dillon, and then in the order that I have them, just so members know, I have Doug Beatty, Gemma Dolan, Rachel Woods, Emma Rogan. So uh, Linda Dillon, and then Doug Beatty. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Linda. Yes. We can hear you. Okay, the, the connection isn't brilliant. Pierce, thank you very much to, to both of you for, for coming today. I have a, a number of questions. Just and I'm not sure whether these are questions that you can answer or whether we'd have to put them back to the department. But just in relation to figures for committal hearings where a guilty plea is made or the, the case doesn't then have to proceed to a full hearing. I'm wondering if we have any figures around around that because obviously I mean one of the, the cases that have been put forward in, in your proposal and, and to be fair in the proposal last week by the bar also you know that they made the same point and it's a fair enough point but i'm just wondering is it what what are the actual facts around that then the in the absence of um a committal hearing are there any ideas about because you talk about committal hearing or similar type process so is there a similar type process that you would have in mind? Is there an example of best practice in, in any other jurisdiction around that? Um, again, have we any figures on committal hearings that don't proceed to follow hearing because of um, don't meet the evidential threshold? So obviously PPS have said they've uh, met the evidential threshold, but then as you've outlined, it may go to committal and, and witnesses for whatever reason um, may re recall things differently. Um, so, do you want do you want to answer those first, Pierce? I don't want to give you a whole list of things. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You put out a bit the start of so uh, but I'll try my best. The, the gist of it is, um, we don't have any facts or figures, unfortunately, before us. They would be yeah. within the gift of the Department of Justice for the facts and figures. Um, no. the, the, come on. So, there are a number of places which switch. Would be returned at the stage from the magistrate's court, the crown court, which don't proceed to trial, trial at the crown court on the basis of mm -hmm. the judge looking at the paper to say that so there's there's insufficient evidence. This is called an no bill application, which is where the defence make an application to try it. The judge to say there is insufficient evidence on the papers to allow the case to proceed. And there will be a number of the, those cases that are successful. I wouldn't have any fact the figures, but I'd certainly be aware of a number of those cases. So we, at that stage, um, the Crown Court job, which is taken a view that that case probably should, should have been challenged at the committal stage. Um, but there are a number of those cases. As we go, first, an alternative process. Um, I mean, it's, it's really, it's hard to know how you, 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 you think you've got a better process than you have with the minute, which is where the prosecution gallery is given to the defence, and then decide, the judge makes a, I mean, it's like, it's like a filtering exercise, but a legally qualified judge decides. I think we've just lost Pierce. Have we lost Pierce? Owen, no um, pressure. I'm going to bring you in to pick up. Sure. As what's often missed, thank you, Chair, in this is that it's not just about the procedure in the court for those number of minutes or whatever period of time that takes. It's, 
It's ensuring fairness, fair, fair, ensuring just outcomes, and access to information is the key for me. It's a mechanism to get the paperwork to the suspect, to their lawyer, to all the parties in the proceedings, and that is the main benefit from the current procedures because a case that and solicitors have a unique insight into this because solicitors will deal with a suspect or indeed a victim from the very outset and solicitors often represent victims be it in terms of compensation or representations to the prosecution service or to the police but in the role where they represent the, like the Dean Park or suspect they will want to try and assist by obtaining information and this is the best process that one can imagine in terms of obtaining that because very frequently very or in all cases effectively you're given perhaps one sheet of paper at the start of the case and you might wait months and months if not into years to then get a second page and then thankfully the committal papers are where the balance is, is, is addressed in terms of that information deficit so it's about getting the papers behind the committal proceedings, getting the evidence against the suspect. Okay. Sure. Well, well, and thank, thanks for that. I have a couple more questions. And thank, thank you. You've just, you've just given me the, the number of the problem. And, and the bar, bar looked at this last week. Uh, sorry, sorry, Pierce is back. Sorry. But the bar alluded to this last week as well. The problem is actually not removing the committal process. The problem is the disclosure process. Is that fair to say? So, I mean, the bar outlined that there, there's an issue. I mean, well, there may be slightly different issues between different organisations. The bar outlined one of the issues is that even particularly around where evidence would be on, say, CCTV, body worn cameras, that, that kind of evidence. And now that there is a process where that can be electronically shared between PSNA and PPS, but there isn't the facility yet to be able to share that with obviously people in, in, in your own profession, so and, and lawyers. Which, I mean, are these not the things that we need to be addressing? And are there amendments that we could put in to the committal bill around the disclosure process? So I, I accept that there's a resourcing issue. And that's an issue for us to worry about the about with the department and the well aware of the resource and issues around PSNA and around investigation and, and disclosure. But it, it, is the issue actually around disclosure? And the, the, and the real need for committal is around that disclosure process. So is that is that the problem that we actually need to fix? Uh, I hope you hear me. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Pierce. Yes, Pierce. Sorry, yeah, just, yeah, yeah disclosure is a, is, a, is a post, that's a secondary process, that's a secondary, effectively, the first book, that's what, that's the prosecution, that's the bus, the level, the intended life, one, the second stage is a disclosure, which is, which can be relevant to a truck, but isn't relevant to the, isn't direct, irrelevant to evidence they tend to call. There are major difficult is with disclosure and, and um, no certain chairman tell us for many years. Yeah. Um, the problem is the prosecution should get the disclosure done at a very early stage. They should consider the disclosure issues at an early stage and progress it. It doesn't affect the committal as such because we aren't actually given the disclosure material at that stage. We're only given that after the committal is already. I think what you're touching on, uh, um, Linda, is the issue of which, which Michael Ford puts upon is the failure to access uh, body worn footage and CCTV and that type of thing that the prosecution have now set up a system, a box system, and they call it, which allows them to look at it, but they can't share it with us. And that's, that is a, a, a big problem. And I think last week, part of the thing that you raised was, why is it taking a year if the prosecution to roll that out to, to defence? And that's a question that you could probably better ask them. people coming after us now and listen to that, but sir, me, that would speed things up if we could get access to the, 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 the CCTV, the body worn footage. That. Oh. I, I, I. 
I, I got what Pierce was saying there, Owen. So um, I'm content with that response, and he's right. And I will be asking. I will be asking the PPS the, the question around the the um, that type of evidence, the body worn on CCTV example. But yes, just my, my, last, my last point then, and I suppose in, in the interest of being hunt, I given a lot of the evidence that has come from the, the bar library and from your sales, would really query how much this is going to speed up just, just but for me this was attractive for a different reason and it was that specific issue around witnesses and victims potentially being um, cross-examined twice and that, that is a real focus for me, it's something that I have grave concerns about and I don't like it if I don't be honest, I don't like that potential. I've seen how traumatic it is for those people to be cross-examined on one occasion. I certainly hope that the, the other suggestions within the Gillen report will improve the situation for um, victims and witnesses. But we, we have a long, long way to go, in my view, in how victims and witnesses, particularly, but not, not entirely or exclusively, but particularly, around those serious sexual offensive cases and whilst it, I know you've outlined the protections that are in place and they re really are welcome, that doesn't remove the extremely traumatic process of getting out of it once, never mind twice. Yes, I, again, that's one of the points where there must be more detail because no one knows when information, papers, statements of evidence, disclosure will be provided in a new era. But that applies to suspects, but also to victims, because, and in our submissions, we'd indicated uh, as part of the Gillen review that there was reference made to the UN handbook on justice for victims. And it was indicated, uh, and uh, the Gillen review flagged this, there must be a provision in full of information on the procedures and processes involved for victims. And if we don't have the detail as to how this new procedure is going to work, not only will that cause difficulties on the defence side, but it will cause difficulties on the prosecution side with victim support and with individuals who will be unclear as to when, if at all, or how many times they will be required to give evidence. So again, more detail would help everyone, including on behalf of victims and suspects. Th thanks very much for that one here both. I'm sure that, that that's one of my questions, but I think that some of the issues that you have raised will certainly be issues that we will have the department. So that, that's been a very helpful um, and informative presentation. So thank you for that to both thank of you. you. Thank, thank you all and Pierce both. Okay, thank, thank you, Linda. Um, and then just before I bring in, just before I bring, bring in Doug, there's a, if members can mute themselves, even whenever they've asked the question, then mute themselves again. And if Pierce and Owen can do the same, it'll just stop. There's quite a lot of feedback just coming around this room, and, and that'll affect the recording of the transcript and so on. So I appreciate Technically, we're trying to navigate all of this, um, but we are dealing with legislation and it's important that we get an accurate transcript. So, um, Doug, I'll bring you in at this stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and uh, I hope you can hear me because it has been a really difficult line yeah. um, to, to get a lot of the answers. But, um, Pearson Owen, th thank you for, for a really useful um, presentation and answering those questions. I suppose, and, and I guess Linda and Sinead has covered um, most of what I was thinking about. Um, but, but I'm struck by the fact is that uh, this committal bill seems to be completely focused wrong, because what you're saying is there's no issue in regards to the committal right up to Crown Court, but all of the issues seem to sit with the, the evidence gathering, and that is the PSNI, the Forensic Science, uh, and the PPS. Um, uh, and therefore, there needs to be a focus on that if we're going to particularly speed up justice and indeed um, if we deal with the cost issues. But can I, and, and, and you can comment on that just, just to make sure I'm getting right what you're saying, but can, can, I, can I just then ask, is there anything within your processes, anything at all, which you think that you could just 
tweak or change or amend which would actually speed it up because I'm really interested in the the speeding up uh, of justice. Thank you, Mr. Weedy. Uh, it's Pierce here. Um, yeah, you've, you've got our point exactly in relation to the delay. We don't believe that removing the battle proceedings will, will change the, the speed of the, the process at all. The, 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 the difficulty is simply down to resources when it comes to investigation stage, is that the, the, a lot of the police work involved in prosecutions these days is of a technical nature. It is CCTV, it is phones, it is computers, and that takes time, and they need to get more resources to get that moving forward. Having said that, they also need to engage with the prosecution at an early stage, and the prosecution should engage with the defence at an early stage because there will be issues that we don't have to. We don't have to uh, be adversarial about at all. There will be material that we can agree on a, on a uh, you know, the most perfunctory basis. We don't need to deal with every issue as a, as a contested matter. So certainly I think the early engagement with the prosecution and the defence and the early engagement with the police and the prosecution are two things that would help speed things up. Um, as regards to how to speak matters apart from that, it, it, it's, it's really down to um, the number of cases you have coming through at any given time. The court resources are also finite. They have a certain number of courts that they can have to have trials. Uh, I do think that the pilot, the pilot scheme in relation to guilty pleas is a very useful exercise and one that we should um, all try and look at more in that if, it, if a defendant who is in a police station admits the matters, do we really need to go and get a forensic report to say that what he had in his pocket was cannabis or what he had in his bag was cannabis? If he says, yeah, it was mine, we don't need that report and we need to look at that. And we need to look at a way that the copper fastens and allows the defence to say at an early stage, we are accepting our client's guilt and we want to move the matter to sentencing as quickly as possible. That doesn't deal with trials, that deals with those cases which are guilty, please, obviously. Trials are more problematic. And, and chiming in with what um, Linda Dillon has said, sexual cases are always the most difficult because they nearly always go to trial and that's that's what causes a problem and they're the ones with the most vulnerable victims in as well um, but also they're the ones in which people are usually defendants are usually most adamant that they're not guilty and that's why they always go to trial the, the way of speeding those matters up is very difficult because police have to do uh, interviews with, with often with young witnesses and young injured parties that can take time there is need for disclosure of all medical records need for disclosure of all uh, mental health records in relation to uh, injured parties in relation to defendants so that can all take time it's hard to know exactly how to, to speed things up. I think resources into investigation stage certainly is one thing, but I think a, a generally more collaborative view between the prosecution and the defence with regard to how, what, can, what issues can be identified and that we can agree on and move things forward would be a benefit. At the minute, we don't really engage the prosecution until later on in the process, and that is a, a difficulty. You know, so I think there's some, there's some work to be done around that engagement, which could benefit the system. Sorry, and very briefly, Pierce, on that, and and I'll not trouble you further. How does that engagement work at this moment in time? Is it is it done through an informal basis with the the investigatory agencies? Is it is it is it done through a specific um, forum? Uh, what's the what's the actual mechanism that's that's used in, in that? Just of my own knowledge, yeah. please. Well, funny, COVID has been a bit of a benefit in that because up, up until COVID took place, we really had uh, very little impact and very little. Con con uh, contact with the prosecution apart from what took place in court. So you'd, you'd approach the prosecutor in the morning of court to speak to them about the case, but you wouldn't have an awful lot of contact beyond that. COVID has led to a situation where there's much more contact now between defence and prosecution by email, by telephone, by CJSM, which allows an interaction. Um, what we haven't got to is a point where we actually discuss a case until the material is all gathered. So you can't, there's, there's no forum for allowing us to have a sort of an informal conversation about where we're going with the case, it, it's, it's until the formal process takes place, until all the paperwork. And in reality, in a Crown Court case, the engagement prosecution doesn't take place till, till the arraignment stage at the, at the Crown Court, the full engagement. And that, that is something I think we could look at, all parties could look at, is an earlier, an earlier engagement with both parties to see what issues can be resolved. Uh, th thank you, Peter. Really informative. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Gemma Dolan. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks to Owen and Pierce. I just have one question, so hopefully the connection stays up. Um, is there any other way of resolving non-disputed issues between parties in the absence of a committal hearing? <laughs> I'm not, not sure if I was supposed to come in there. Uh, in, in relation to a solicitor's role, we, we have that approach from the outset. If we're contacted by an individual who's under arrest, 
in the police station, much as there have been significant challenges because of COVID, COVID and the inability to get you know, direct access to a detained person or let alone information to assist. But from the outset, we're trying to get information to, to allow us to advise the individual better and speak to the police officers that are involved in the question sessions, the interviews, or even the detention of, of a suspect. Again, when the case proceeds to court, we will engage with the prosecutor or some of the police officers as best as possible. And again, what's missed in this debate is a lot of these indictable only cases are actually withdrawn before there's PE papers or a committal suggested. And that's again with the defence involving uh, themselves in negotiations or discussions or whatever way you want to phrase that. And again, that can happen in and around the committal proceedings. Again, when you see the papers and information open, opens up those debates. And sometimes the solicitors have an advantage over the prosecution and the defence because we know this, the, the instructions from the suspect or the individual, which is a part of the jigsaw that the prosecution and the police don't have. So again, it's what it indicated earlier, albeit operate within an adversarial system, there can be room for collaboration and working together, you know, certainly on, on certain points that uh, are worth discussion and are non-controversial. But again, COVID has shown some example of good practice, but also the challenges in this, the box system that has been talked about well, at the outset, in the early difficulties of COVID and disruption to courts, there was a suggestion that the Public Prosecution Service would allow the defence access to that to share papers, let alone technology or uh, orientated evidence. But that un unfortunately floundered. And I think in more recent times, the box system has clicked into action as discussed previously with the committee, where the police and the prosecution have more collaboration with that uh, use of technology. Again, the defence haven't been pulled into that. And it's back to sharing of information, be it disclosure, papers. But the, the, the more information that's shared, the more fairness there is, the more justice there is, the more everyone can work to a conclusion that's just in a swift fashion. And there's wonderful phrases, you know, that, that, that are admirable in and around avoidable delay, the identification of early guilty plea. All of that can be worked on collaboratively if the structures are in, place, are in place and the main sets are in place. You know, quite often you'll find that individual police officers, for example, will become too bedded into an adversarial approach from early. And because they don't disclose information, that blocks any progression at an early stage. But, but again, if everyone buys into the mindset of sharing information to help the criminal justice system, that will absolutely speed up all processes. And if there can be some concrete processes put in place, all the better to choreograph with that. And uh, again, th those type of uh, efforts are much better than the movement of delay, the rebranding of delay, or indeed the redecoration of delay and it's just been placed at another court venue rather than the Magistrates' Court. Okay, thank you, Owen. Thanks, Chair, that's me. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll bring in Rachel Woods now into the spotlight, please. Hi, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, that's great. Thank you, Rachel. Great. Thank you very much, Owen um, and Pierce. Thank you very much for your presentation and the written submission. A lot of my questions have already been answered, so I'll not labour them. But I just want to pick up in terms of what Doug Beatty had asked, and you had mentioned about collaboration and early engagement um, between the prosecution and defence, and that would help um, in terms of delay. Does that require legislation, or is that a change of practice policy? Um, and if that's such, you know, why? What would need to happen to get to get to that point? I think I'll answer that. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Pierce again. Um, I don't. I don't think it does require legislation. I think what it requires is, is a change in, in uh, policy and a change in process up to now. Uh, and I say, COVID strangely has worked out quite well. We had a large number of meetings with the PPS, which have been sometimes fruitful, sometimes less fruitful, but we need to be able to get in a situation where we can collaboratively share information. And as Owen quite rightly says, the information about a case is what 
will progress it until you have all the information you can progress your case. I can't advise a client unless I know exactly what he's, the charges he's facing and what evidence he's facing. So the, the sharing information is crucial to it. Um, and, but I think that what we're really looking at, and I suppose um, this is a matter for the, the Law Society and the Bar Council to meet with the PPS on a more regular basis, is to put in place protocols, I suppose, which I hate the use of, the protocols and that type of thing, which will allow us to engage at an earlier stage and allow us to then share that information and get in a get position where we can progress things quicker. And I think that's, that's I, don't think, I don't think it requires legislation. Um, where legislation, and this is, we haven't talked about this, but it's in our paper, um, where legislation might be useful uh, um, is uh, in, in some jurisdictions they have a custody time limit issue for the prosecution, which is where if you, if you go beyond a certain time, you have to be considered for bail. We don't have that in this jurisdiction, and we have very long delays in this jurisdiction. We tend to, I mean, we're, we're, very, we're very kindly saying it's an investigative process, but it's down to the prosecution the police not having the material forward. We're accepting that at this point in time. But if you've custody time limits, it certainly focuses the minds of the prosecution. Thank you, Pierce. I think you're reading my uh, notes because that is me on nicely to my next question, which um, is about the part in your submission on the, uh, you'd said about introducing the time limits within the proposed reforms and you noted that there was no bail act for Northern Ireland and custody time limits are included in the proposed reforms. So you have mentioned that, but um, and this also could be a matter for the department, but do you know why uh, regulations that we currently have at disposal haven't been made yet? And also would you support uh, proposals or amendments within this committal reform if uh, applicable regarding the bail act? The short answer to that is yes. Um, the, the reason they haven't been put in place is because uh, all those involved in the process realised they wouldn't be met. And I think the Department of Justice are, are realistic enough and to, to, to appreciate that if, and then, well, depending on what time limits are set, obviously, but that the, at the, on, the per, on the current time limits, they would be very far hard pushed to meet what time limits are imposed in other jurisdictions. So I think that's why it hasn't been implemented. But again, that probably is a question for the Department rather than ourselves. We would support such things. We, we would support the implementation of the Bail Act, and we'd also support the idea that the prosecution was set set time. Like if you look at Scotland, for instance, Scotland it's very, very short time limits for 90 days or something like that, I think it is, or 96 days to get a case to a Crown Court. So, I mean, that focuses the minds of prosecution very strongly. Um, but I'm not, not necessarily advocating that, but, uh, but we need something which would focus the mind. At the minute, this is part of the reason why we think that the committal is important. A district judge can focus the mind of a prosecutor and say what has to be done and put a strict timetable, arrange for officers in charge to attend court and explain why things haven't been done. And that is good pressure. And that's that's used in the committal process or up to, up to the committal process at this stage. So we don't want to lose that either. So we, we think it's important that there are strict time frames put in for the prosecution and the police to allow the case to progress quickly. Thanks, Pierce. Chair, um, I, my third question has already been answered, so um, I'll, leave, I'll leave that one. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Emma Rogan. Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Emma. We can hear you. Um, my question is a follow on from um, Rachel's previous question, and it again is around the time limits. So, given the current delays that we have seen recently with COVID and the um, unforeseen circumstances that COVID, like this time two years ago, we wouldn't have, have even thought about it and been dealing with the, the onslaught of, of, of it, what impact um, could potentially see with people? If the time scales aren't adhered to, could it be the potential be that people who are guilty could go free if the, the time scales are not um, not stuck to? Is that a, a potential outcome? They, they may, so, sorry, I'm as Pierce McDermott here. Uh, they wouldn't go, guilty people wouldn't go free as such. What would happen would be that a person who was in custody, a person who had been remanded in custody, uh, not being found guilty of anything but being charged with a matter. Would be entitled to be considered for bail at a certain point in time and excited to get bail and that bail wouldn't necessarily be it wouldn't be just off you go down the street there would be strong conditions attached to it usually there'd be tags curfews reporting to police all of those type of matters and the importance of the time limits aren't that people who are, are potentially guilty get set free it's that the person who is in custody who may not be guilty shouldn't stay in custody any longer than they have to and that's that's the purpose of the custody time limits is to prevent a situation where somebody who may ultimately be acquitted has spent the whole time in custody way beyond that which is considered reasonable. So 
if a guilty person, will, if found guilty, the end will still get whatever sentence they get. It uh, just means that on remand, before they get their trial, they'll be able, able to be considered for bail and possibly bail with conditions. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions, Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Gordon Dunn. Hello. All right, can you Gordon. hear me now? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much uh, to Pierce and Owen for your presentation. Just a couple of points on the progress of cases. Uh, how are they prioritised uh, in the various cases? I'm thinking mainly in relation to gathering of this evidence, which you've, you've certainly emphasised is a very heavy, slow process. How, how are cases prioritised and who is responsible for progressing the cases? Is it through PPS staff or others? And I appreciate the police and, and the other services are involved, but who actually progresses them and, and links up the chain, I suppose, would be a way of putting it to make sure that things are moving forward and not sitting. I would say, I suppose, with all due respect, legal eagles and uh, don't have a reputation of speed and those terms don't really work well together. And, you know, I've heard a lot today, but I do wonder, are you just pushing back on something? You know, there is a resistance there. And we're all, I suppose, resistance to change, but I do feel change has to come in relation to this. And we have loved the points you've made, and I do appreciate that change is not always for the best, but I do think there needs to be the speeding up of the legal processes. Gordon Pierce McDermott here. I think you've been going to the wrong solicitor. If you haven't got a speedy response, you must be maybe in a transfer that we're more efficient and fast solicitor like myself. Maybe the property these days is slow. <laughs> uh, Prioritisation wise, it, it's an interesting question, and I think it's one probably again you, you could ask the PPS when they come behind us. I think within the initial structure, the police themselves, they have a system whereby they have a senior officer looks at an individual case and uh, they decide what, which, for instance, forensics which forensic cases should be prioritised. So the police do that initially, and the PPS then supervise that. But I'm not 100% sure myself as to who actually prioritises it in the investigation stage. I, hope, I would like to think that prosecution you appear after us be able to tell you that. Um, I understand what you're saying about delays, and um, I don't actually, and I'm joking aside, I don't accept that the delays in the justice system, the criminal justice system in particular, are down to solicitors. Uh, there's no benefit in us in delaying cases whatsoever. We're very anxious to get cases on. Uh, and really, once we get a set of papers, once we get the documentation before us, we work on them immediately. We instruct counsel if counsel required. We get clients, we get instructions, we indicate where we're going with the case, and we move on as quickly as we possibly can. There's no benefit to solicitors in, in dragging a case out in the current environment. So um, there are areas that ha can be worked on, and um, say an investigation stage is clearly one of those. The collaboration point is something which we need to work on with the prosecution. I accept that. Uh, but resources are the key to all of this, and both within regard to the investigation and with regard to court resources, having court availability. COVID has made that difficult because court staff as well, but um, we certainly were keen to get things moving. Um, I think the prioritisation is an interesting point, but if I could defer that, if you ask the prosecution, the PPS will appear after us as to who prioritises. Thank you. Okay, Grant. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, Linda Dillon, you just wanted to come back in to get a point of clarity. Sorry, Chair, it's actually being clarified, so thank you. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Here's some um, to Owen. That's fine. Last, but um, by no means least, Mr. Paul Frey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Can I ask, uh, because it's, it's been around the houses here today about the delays, and I would agree that this isn't really about solving delay. It's probably more for me about the impactfulness of, a, of the court case. Uh, for for witnesses uh, and for everybody involved. Uh, last week we heard from the Bar Council who told us about the stress test was very important for evidence. And that's what the committal was very useful for. Is there any way to stress test the, the, the files, the evidence, the documentation without stress testing the witnesses Victims in many cases, and even the uh, the accused. 
Uh, yeah, I, that, I heard that last week. Um, uh, thanks, Mr. Fru. Um, the, the current proposal is two stages. The first stage is to prevent witnesses being called to give evidence on the basis that the witnesses may have to give evidence twice. The second stage is a complete abolition of committal. Um, we've made arguments in relation to the witness point, um, which you may or may not find attractive, but certainly it seems to me that the committee are more interested, or sorry, have an interest in protecting witnesses and victims, um, which is a, a justifiable interest rather than the, the, the false delay argument. There's certainly a provision that could be allowed, which calling of witnesses may be prevented, but that a judge still assesses the documentation, assesses the evidence in the case, and assesses the strength of the prosecution case which won't involve witnesses being called and which won't involve any particular stress on any, anybody apart from the lawyers having to make representations to the judge. And I think that is the abolition of committal proceedings entirely to try and prevent witnesses giving evidence twice is throwing the baby out of the bathwater and defeats a very important, defeats and removes a very important filtering process in the criminal justice system at the present time. So you can have a situation in short which the bill could prevent oral evidence being called by witnesses but could still allow for a judge, a legally trained judge in the Magistrates Court to assess the evidence and see whether that case should progress or not. That's a possibility indeed. Okay, thank you. And, and I'm going to have to go back over the hand sort of this to go digest the questions, I think it was Rachel asked you around the Bail Act uh, and the time uh, aspect with regards to time limits, because I do feel that if we are going to try and tackle the delays, that may well could be a, a tool to use with regards to trying to speed up justice. Uh, but explain to me again, and again, you may have covered this, and I just haven't understood it correctly, and I, you did trigger me with your answers. Uh, when, when, do you, when do you apply for bail? Is it, is it before committal, after committal? And surely the information that you, a judge, would see at committal would be quite useful in, in an application for bail. One way or the other for yep. the judge. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, the, the issue of bail arises when a person is immediately brought before a court. So when someone's in a police station and being interviewed about an offence, there, there are two different or three different outcomes potentially. One, they get they finally get sent off to the prosecution and they receive a summons in due course. The second is they get charged and get bailed by the police to come to court in four weeks' time. And the third and perhaps most relevant to indictable only offences would be where a person is remanded in custody from the police station to the court yeah. and a first appearance in court takes place, which is the ones you read about in the paper every day, so and so appeared charged with X, Y and Z. The issue of bail then arises for the first appearance in a magistrate's court and a magistrate will very often decide whether or not a defendant should get bail at that stage. If bail is refused at a first appearance, the defendant has a right to apply the bail to the High Court and has a right to apply back to Magistrates Court if something has changed. But a person will remain in custody during a period of time before committal. So the committal is, you, you have a first appearance, which has been the charge sheet brings you to court. Your committal won't take place until months down the line from that. And you could remain in custody the entire time. You could be on bail the entire time, or you could have a mixture of being in custody and on bail. At committal, the court will again consider bail. If you're on bail, the court will nearly always automatically remand you on bail. If you're in custody, very often the court remand you in custody, and then, you're, then you then go to the Crown Court after that. So um, the bail doesn't impact upon committals so much as impacts upon the investigative process. And, and the purpose of the Bail Act is to, is to put a time limit on getting it to the stage where you get returned to the Crown Court within a reasonable time, that if, you don't, if the prosecution don't meet that test, that you then are entitled to be considered for bail. So, so the, the statute... That's not too, too, yeah, I'll have to read back on all of this. Uh, I'm certainly yeah. not an expert. Uh, well, it's, 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 I think if you understand the process going from it, the committal is, is is halfway. If you look at if, if you look at a crime court trial, the committal is halfway through. Yes. In the sense of you're initially charged, the prosecution then gather the evidence in the documentary form and give it to PPS. You then get the committal papers, which is your halfway stage. The magistrate decides is there a case to answer. You then go to the crime court trial. So this bail arises at all stages, but really at the start is the first issue. Okay, and, and with regards to statutory time limits, is that just basically a time pressure then on getting back to High Court, or is that for time limits for various things, including a resolution of the case in its entirety? It, there, there, there are a different number of models of time limits, but certainly what we'd be looking at would be the one which says the prosecution must gather the evidence in a case within a certain period of time, and that would be the, the 110 days, I think it is, um, 
uh, in the English system, or the, which allows it, which, which is a time period which which you must have to gather the prosecution case before a person is considered for bail. So it's it's really to put pressure on the prosecution, the police, and the PPS to get the material gathered to present to the court and the defence within that time frame. I, I was just about to say that that seemed to be skewed then towards applying pressure to all of the bodies that are involved, PPS, the police and all of that. And, and I see that that's where, and you've rightly said, the, the delay occurs. Is there, any then, is there any other time pressures that can be applied on the actual to judicial pr procedures once you get that, once you get all that evidence gathered? Yes, well, there, there is a second set of time limits. That's, that's the time limit to the committal stage, which is where the prosecution gathered all the evidence and present it to the court as a document, not don't present it as an evidence, but present it as a bundle. Yep. The second stage is then from committal to trial, and that then puts the pressure on the judiciary as such to manage the cases so that they fall within the time limits that are provided for in that. So that's 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 the second half has to be done within a time frame which complies with those conditions as well. And that puts the pressure on the, 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 the court and all par all parties, in fact, I think, and the Crown Court to deal with, the, with those matters in that time frame. Uh, and just to be clear, we have no limits like that over here in this jurisdiction. And, and Nothing, whatever. We've had, and, and you know, and, and not being, we've had a number of, any, any number of cases in the Magistrates Court which it can take um, well over a year to get committal proceedings. And now that's not, getting, getting rid of committal proceedings won't speed that up. That just takes a year to get the papers gathered. And I take it that throughout the world there are, are varying degrees of, of time restraints and limits and pressures on this sort of thing? There are. And, and in fairness, I haven't had an exact look. I know our paper touches upon it, but we certainly haven't looked at it in any huge detail in all our jurisdictions. I know that uh, in the South, for instance, there's a six-month limitation period in getting offences before the court. Scotland's very short time limits, but th there are any number of different jurisdictions that can be looked at. Australia and New Zealand are always good places to look at regarding time limits. Um, but we have no time limits, no time frame whatsoever in relation to anything in this jurisdiction. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, there's no one else, um, so everyone's got to ask questions. Can I thank Owen and uh, Pierce for, for the answers? It's been very helpful. Certainly, I found it a very useful exchange. And uh, we do appreciate the time that uh, the Law Society has taken to engage with the committee on this. And I've no doubt if there's other issues of clarity that we'll uh, want to raise, uh, that you're, you're happy to engage with us further if, if that's necessary. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Thank okay, you. great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, members. Okay, so listen, there's a range of issues that were raised just during that, and again, we'll be producing a summary of, of this evidence session, last week's evidence session, and now we're going to move into the, the next one, and then the summary of that will uh, be sent to the Department for a response to help uh, facilitate members. So we'll keep moving, and in the next item then is an oral evidence session with the Public Prosecution Service. Uh, a copy of the written submission uh, from the PPS is included on pages 49 to 54 of the meeting pack, and uh, hopefully uh, they're in the audience due to come in. So um, can I welcome Michael Agnew, Deputy Director, uh, Francesca Keeney, Head of Strategic Improvement Team from the Public Prosecution Service to the meeting. Um, I'm just going to wait to see, because I don't see them on my list. I'm not sure if the, the broadcasting team are able to, to bring them in. Okay, so I think the PPS team's there. Yes, I can see you on our screen. So again, let me formally welcome Michael Agnew and Francesca Keeney uh, to the meeting. Uh, the session will be reported by Hansard and then a transcript published on the committee uh, web page. So I'm going to hand over to yourselves to outline uh, some of the key issues and then we'll move into questions from members. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Can I just check you can hear us uh, loud and clear? Yes, you're coming through, no problem. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, well, Chair, Committee, we thank you for the invitation to give evidence today on the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. We hope to be able to provide the perspective of the PPS on the important changes which the bill is designed to implement. In our opening statement, we would like to focus on the key issues. I am going to address the Committee on the first issue which relates to whether the right to require prosecution witnesses to attend a committal and give oral evidence should be retained. And then my colleague Francesca will address you on the second issue 
which relates to the expansion of the range of offences which will be subject to the new direct committal procedures. The PPS supports the abolition of oral evidence at any hearing intended to address the sufficiency of evidence available to place a defendant on trial. In terms of the current right to require prosecution witnesses to attend and give evidence at a committal hearing, we would make the following three key points. Firstly, the calling of witnesses, and in particular victims, undoubtedly adds stress and often trauma to their experience of the criminal justice system. It is recognised that having to give evidence twice, once at committal and again at trial, places an unnecessary and unfair burden on victims. It is also of note that cases in which witnesses are cross-examined at committal often resolve subsequently by way of a guilty plea in the Crown Court. It is our view that many of those cases would have resulted in a guilty plea even if there had been no contested committal proceedings. In such cases, the proposed reforms will prevent a victim from having to give evidence at all. And the resolution of cases without victims giving evidence, where that is possible and consistent with the defendant's fair trial, is something that the PPS welcomes. Secondly, it is our experience that mixed committals can also lead to very significant delay. Whilst the focus has quite properly been on the impact on victims, often in cases involving sexual offences, it is important also to be alive to the benefits of the proposed reforms in other types of cases. An obvious example is prosecutions for terrorist offences. And we are aware of many examples of mixed committals which have added up to, and in some cases more than, a year of avoidable delay. They've also generated significant additional costs. And thirdly, there are already significant checks and balances within the system that ensure that the defendant's fair trial rights are adequately protected. There is the opportunity to challenge the sufficiency of evidence on the papers in the Crown Court. The seriousness of providing a truthful witness statement is brought to bear upon a witness by the declaration that the witness must sign which advises them of the potential for prosecution if the statement contains anything which they know to be false or do not believe to be true. And finally, there is the fact that the test for prosecution has been applied to the case by the PPS before anyone is sent for trial under the current procedures. The calling of oral evidence at committal does not, in our view, make any significant contribution to the filtering of weak cases. Whilst the figures taken from the court database indicate that 75 out of 1,765 defendants were not committed for trial, our own inquiries have not identified any case in which the undermining of oral evidence by cross-examination has resulted in the case being dismissed. I should say that we were looking up figures specifically for 2019 there. I can provide the committee with further details in due course and potentially in relation to some of the questions that will follow. But the reasons in these cases for defendants not being returned for trial include cases where defendants did not appear, defendants had uh, died in the intervening period, and also in a significant number of ca cases, witness difficulties, such as a failure to, to, to attend or a withdrawal statement being made. In these cases, the prosecution proactively withdrew the case rather than the case being dismissed by the judge. In a significant number of the cases identified, proceedings were in fact subsequently recommenced, for example, because an arrest warrant was subsequently executed. If oral evidence at committal is to be abolished, then it follows that there should be no oral evidence at an application to dismiss. Otherwise, the policy objectives of the bill will be undermined and a defendant will have different rights dependent upon the procedure by which they are sent to the Crown Court. An application involving oral evidence in the Crown Court would also generate significant additional costs. We would add that whilst the relevant English provisions originally provided for oral evidence at an application to dismiss with leave of the court, a subsequent partial repeal means that the defence, similar to the proposal for this jurisdiction, can no longer require prosecution witnesses to give oral evidence at such a hearing. And finally, in relation to the proposal to apply an interest of justice test to the requirement for witnesses to be called at a pre-trial hearing, we accept that that would afford better protection to victims and witnesses than presently exists, and would also reduce the number of lengthy and costly committals. However, the PPS view is that the department's proposal provides better protection without compromising a defendant's fair trial rights. Furthermore, 
It provides the victim or witness with certainty from the outset of the proceedings that in the event of a contested case, they will only be required to give evidence once at trial. The alternative is that they are left with the possibility of giving pre-trial evidence hanging over them until and unless there is a ruling from the judge that it is not in the interest of justice for them to do so. I'm now going to pass to Francesca, who will explain the second key aspect of the Reform Bill, which relates to how it will expand the range of offences, which will be subject to the new direct committal procedures. It was originally intended a direct committal would apply only to cases where an accused was charged with murder or manslaughter. The bill broadens the scope of offences that will be brought within the provisions to those where an accused has been charged with any indictable only offence. Given the PPS commitment to reduce an avoidable delay and the period of time that has elapsed since the 2015 Act was passed, we are supportive of a more ambitious approach to the initial rollout, which will also assist in the delivery of various recommendations made by Sir John Gillen, the Criminal Justice Inspector, the Independent Reporting Commission and others. To assess the impact of this change, it is important to fully understand how direct committal is intended to operate. When a defendant appears before a magistrate's court charged with an indictable only offence, Section 11 of the 2015 Act will require the court to commit the accused to the Crown Court forthwith. The nature of the offence charged requires the court to act then and there, without consideration of the sufficiency of the evidence. The really significant impact of this change will be felt in respect of charge cases. Currently, charge cases are remanded in the Magistrates' Court until a decision is taken and PE papers are served. Cases are then sent to the Crown Court at a time when, from the prosecution perspective, they are essentially trial-ready. Under the new provisions, any defendant who appears before a Magistrates' Court charged with an indictable only offence will be transferred immediately to the Crown Court. It has not yet been determined when that first appearance in the Crown Court will be, but in England and Wales, under analogous provisions, it takes place between 28 and 35 days later. This is a very significant change to Northern Ireland's criminal justice system. It is also what has led to some expressing concerns about the Crown Court becoming an expensive remand court. There is undoubtedly that risk, but the opportunity provided by the proposed reforms is that it will allow the Crown Court judge to actively manage serious cases from the outset. This can result in the early identification and disposal of cases which can be resolved by way of a guilty plea. In those cases which are not suitable for an early guilty plea, the judge can ensure that parties focus on the key issues, agree witnesses where possible, and take other steps intended to reduce the time taken to get to trial, and also the duration of the trial itself. This is the approach adopted in England and Wales, known as Better Case Management, which was recommended by Sir John Gillan in his report on serious sexual offences, on which we would strongly advocate. PPS considers that this bill represents a very important first step towards transforming how the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland deals with serious criminal cases. It is our view that a number of further measures will be required in order to create the cultural change necessary to maximise the opportunities presented by the new processes. These include mandatory duties of direct engagement between the parties, proportionate file building, and robust case management by the judges. It will also require a revised legal aid framework that supports the front-loading of work and incentivises the efficient conduct of cases. The PPS looks forward to engaging with our criminal justice partners once the final shape of the bill is ascertained, in order to work on the detailed arrangements that will support the bill's objectives of tackling avoidable delay for the benefit of victims, witnesses and the wider public. Right. We, um, that concludes our opening remarks. Um, we hope there are some assistance to the committee and we will of course do our best to answer the further questions that the committee will have.
Okay, thank you. Um, That's very helpful. I'll just uh, start with a, a couple of questions. Um, the, the Law Society and the Bar have both uh, made their case and, and done so, I think, actually very articulately and, and highlighting how uh, the abolition of mixed committals, in their view, wouldn't actually speed up the process um, because it's this investigatory work that takes the, the time. So on, on what basis would the abolition of mixed committals actually speed it up um, if you still have the main stumbling blocks in terms of the kind of work that needs to take place? Are you not just moving this problem into the Crown Court? Right. There are a couple of aspects to that. Um, the first is that in PEs that go through on the papers, um, there is little additional delay. However, if there is a contested committal, that can add significant delay. And as I said in my opening remarks, um, we have many examples of cases taking six to 12 months um, more uh, in terrorist cases. And I also looked at recently at um, a sexual offence case that took three years from the first date for committal and the actual return for trial. So in those cases, it will automatically make a difference. But I suppose the, the more important point potentially is what is required to go along with the direct transfer proceedings because as we've tried to explain, and I think there has been some um, maybe confusion around this, but certainly our understanding of the legislation that at the first appearance in the magistrate's court, court the defendant, if he's charged with an indictable only offence, will automatically be transferred to the Crown Court, and so a second appearance will be in the Crown Court. And what that does, it provides for an opportunity to manage a case in a way that just does not take place under the current systems. Um, as was explained um, um, previously, the current system is based upon a committal process where there's no mandatory engagement between the prosecution and the defence, and the police and the prosecution build their case, and they build it in a way such that they're really covering every base. So it's a sort of belts and braces, um, gold standard approach that gets all the evidence on the papers, and then um, that is served on the defence, and then there'll be a committal and then an appearance in the Crown Court. This is going to get the cases into the Crown Court much earlier, and there are a number of advantages in doing so, potentially. Um, the first being that the Crown Court judge at that stage can really put some pressure on the parties to identify those cases which might uh, resolve early by way of a guilty plea. And in those cases which can't resolve early by way of a guilty plea, can actively manage the case to ensure that the key issues are focused on anything that can be agreed is agreed. Um, and that's something that we think is missing from the current system. Um, we do have something called the Indictable Cases Pilot, um, which tries to um, apply some of these principles in certain uh, serious cases at the moment, but it's all done on a voluntary basis and there's no judicial oversight of it um, because the case isn't in the Crown Court. But the idea is that if we can get the cases into the Crown Court, um, we can have a new level of case management where not only are the prosecution and the defence uh, present, um, but the defence will have their counsel instructed at that stage. Um, and that can be important because sometimes uh, the defence, until they've had counsel instructed and advice from counsel, may be reluctant to make concessions um, and they'll want that advice. So the idea that we have all the parties there um, under uh, close scrutiny by a senior judge is what gives us the opportunity to narrow issues and really tackle delay that way. Okay, and is, is it only at that Crown Court level that the, the judge has that kind of influence to try and drive a case forward? Um, is that different to the kind of powers that a district magistrate judge has? It is different because the, the district judge is looking to get a case to committal. And so whenever a case is before, appearing before a district judge, as was explained um, by the Law Society, they can be seeking updates and they're wondering, how long is it going to take to get this evidence? How long before the prosecution are in a position to serve their evidence so that we can have a committal hearing? Um, but that engagement um, does not involve trying to identify whether a case might be guilty. It doesn't try to um, identify you know, what issues can be agreed or anything. It's solely based upon getting to committal and getting through committal. It's not based upon setting the case up for trial or getting to trial quickly or reducing the length of time that the trial might take. So it's a very different type of supervision. Okay. Um, and then 
In terms of the, the kind of suggestion just at the end of the presentation for the Law Society, what if you retained these um, magistrate level committal proceedings uh, on the basis of the district judge only reviewing papers and not uh, a witness coming forward to give oral evidence, you know, bearing in mind that additional stress that I think everybody recognises that giving evidence twice can have. Is that something that is worth considering or what, what, what view would you take on that? Yeah, well, well that, that's retaining effectively the status quo. Um, so we're, I, mean, I think as I've tried to indicate, we, we have safeguards in the system and they involve, in, in dialogue only offences, a senior prosecutor uh, applying the test for prosecution. And I think the evidence would indicate that it is in the most exceptional case that a district judge will disagree as to whether or not there's a case to answer. And in fact, the test that the prosecutor applies is arguably a higher test than that which a district judge um, is applying. Um, but the other point is, if we continue to have a process by which the district judge reviews all the papers, it, will, it requires that time to build the case, to build the papers, to serve them on the defence on the court. Um, and that is, I think, what we're trying to move away from, um, which is to get the case into the Crown Court much earlier, uh, so that we can build the cases, we can, as I said earlier, identify the guilty pleas, narrow the issues in the not guilty pleas, focus on, on the other benefit of, of, of that approach. Um, I mean, obviously, the evidence was given earlier about the time that it takes to um, prepare cases, and no doubt there are issues around resources and, and delays. But if we can ensure that whenever we're getting an expert report, um, it is one that is going to go to an issue that is actually going to be in dispute at the trial, then that is obviously much better than having gone through nugatory work or obtaining a report that relates to something that, in respect of which a concession was ultimately made. So we're trying to focus the resources. The idea is that we have a much more efficient system where um, cases are built proportionately and where there are contested issues, absolutely, those might require the very most detailed forensic examinations, but where issues can be agreed, um, that is done and that is recorded and the parties move on to the other issues. Okay, okay, thank you, that's, that's been helpful. Um, I'll bring in uh, other members at this stage, so Linda Dillon and then Gordon Dunn, um, so Linda, and I see other members there just so that they know I've noticed them, Rachel Woods, Sinead Bradley, and I'll take folks in that order. So Linda Dillon in the first instance. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for the presentation. It certainly has been helpful, and, and from one presentation to the other, you, you hear entirely different things, but that's fair enough. You are, are coming at it from different angles, and, and I accept that. Can I just ask um, one technical question? You raised the issue of a potential risk as a result of the removal of Section 10 under the 2015 Act. And you've you've alluded to the fact that guidance would be sufficient to address that. Are you sure that guidance would be sufficient or is there a need to amend the legislation? No, we think um, we think that guidance would be sufficient. The, the risk that we referred to in our written submission was the fact that um, there is still an application to dismiss um, and under Section 10, whenever a case went up, because somebody had accept, you know, was indicating that they were going to accept their guilt, um, they, were, they couldn't have it both ways. They couldn't say, we're, we're accepting our guilt, but whenever you serve evidence on us, we're going to say there's insufficient evidence. Okay? So that was built in to, um, section, uh, to, to the legislation. But we think that that can be accommodated under any um, regulations or Crown Court rules or practice direction that might go along in order to support uh, the direct transfer legislation. So that if somebody does give an early indication of a guilty plea, um, they um, come before the Crown Court. The Crown Court judge either, I, I think it would, it would be quite a brave defence representative who might um, try to make an application to dismiss, um, having indicated that they were going to plead guilty. But certainly the, you know, the defendant would be entitled to change his mind before he actually entered his not guilty plea. But there are ways of managing that and obviously adjournments to allow the prosecution to build their case, um, we think would be sufficient to address any risk. Okay, and then just in relation to the, the chairs already sort of spoke to this a little bit, but I would just like a wee bit more detail. How, how can we be certain that direct committal, that we're not just moving without obviously additional resources for PPS and PSNA, that we're not just moving the delay from one part of the system to another? Yes. Well, if we 
we just transfer a case to the Crown Court and then do exactly the same that we currently do, which is a series of remands without defence engagement while we build our case, um, then there is that risk. But the way to avoid it is to ensure that there's active case management. So the cases that end up that, that can be resolved quickly by way of a guilty plea can be addressed in the Crown Court, because under the, under the current uh, processes, we have to build com committal papers, we have to have a committal hearing, we have to get the defendant into the Crown Court before a guilty plea can be entered. So we can potentially get those guilty pleas a lot earlier in the process. And then in terms of the uh, contested cases, if we, if we can narrow the issues between the parties, um, we can hopefully you know, get, get to the core of the issue a lot more quickly than we can under the uh, current system. Okay. Um, effect, sorry, sorry, just maybe just to add to that. The other point for this to be effective is what we don't want is to arrive into the Crown Court and then have lots of hearings in the Crown Court because having hearings in the Crown Court is a, is a way to rack up expense. So you know, one of the principles that is applied um, under the arrangements that work in England is, is what's called fewer, more effective hearings. So what, what we want is the early engagement between the parties to resolve as much as possible without the need for judicial hearings. But we need that first judicial hearing to be one that really focuses the minds of the parties and then sets out a clear pathway either to the case being disposed of by way of a guilty plea or the case being prepared for trial. And then we need the parties to comply with the detailed directions that we hope the judges will set out at that hearing. I suppose that that's my point. How do we ensure that happens? Is there something that we need to put into this legislation around that to ensure that that happens? because a lot of that is relying on people to do the right thing and don't get me wrong I'm not for one second saying that they won't but we know and, 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 you, and you spoke to this a wee, a wee bit earlier yourself that cultural change there needs to be a cultural change and that's right throughout the system right from the investigating officers right through PPS also and, and right through to the, the judiciary system and those who serve it so solicitors and lawyers There's, there is a cultural change absolutely I believe needed there and in, in, in the and the approach to how we deal with this. So I'm wondering how do we ensure that we give the greatest protection in the interim of that cultural change happening because it won't happen overnight. No, it, it certainly won't. And I think as we've tried to outline in our submission, we think that in fact in England and Wales they have what are called the criminal procedure rules, um, which are detailed rules setting out how proceedings in the Crown Court um, should progress after they are directly transferred. Um, they also have a number of practice directions and they also then almost bring that all together all together under this sort of umbrella of better case management. And then there's a, there's a handbook which effectively summarizes the key principles from those practice directions and, and criminal procedure rules and gives all the participants a step-by-step -step process which they should, which they, um, should follow. And, but that is something that, as Francesca said, we would strongly support. So John Gillan had a look at it, he went over and actually watched it in operation in England and Wales and was really very impressed with it. Um, so I suppose we see it not so much as a matter of this legislation, but I think what we will need is a clear framework, um, not within this bill, but either by way of practice direction or potentially um, in the Crown Court rules or some um, sort of statutory case management rules. Um, we need that framework, and there's a lot of work we feel to be uh, done. I think once we know the final shape of this bill, in order um, in order to achieve that, and that's going to involve um, very detailed conversations. We think with all the practitioners, um, ourselves, the defence, um, and the judges as well, to, to get a framework in place, so that whenever these reforms are, if these reforms um, come into force, everybody knows exactly what is expected of them. But then I think it's going to require. Uh, strong judicial leadership. It's, it's going to require a truly collaborative effort. I mean, I think the prosecution, there's no doubt we're going to have to up our game. Um, the defence are going to have to engage um, a lot more than they do in certain types of cases at the moment. And then I think the judges are going to have to hold us all to account. I think, I think you're right. And, and I mean, I certainly would, would love to see that kind of approach. It, it, it sounds like a, a an ideal approach, but I suppose it's, it's wondering whether that will happen. I think, you know, given that the department seem to have given the PPS some kind of indication about how the the process will work in terms of, you know, gi giving you an understanding 
of how the direct um, committal process will work. I think it would have been probably a good idea for the department to have given the the previous those who have previously given us presentations in terms of the bar council. This isn't really for yourself, to be fair. It's more for the chair of the committee. I think we need to um, speak to the department and the officials in relation to that, that it would have been right that the bar council and um, the law society would have had that same type of information. I think that that's extremely important. I mean, it's good that PPS have an understanding of it, but others should have been also engaged with to, to be given an under the same kind of understanding. Chair, sure. can I ask one final question? And it's just in relation to an issue that the, the Bar Council raised last week. Um, it's slightly outside of this, but it's around the disclosure process and the fact that um, PSNA can now share with, with your sales PPS body-worn camera footage um, in terms of it can be shared electronically, the CCTV footage, I think probably mob mobile phone footage and, and stuff like that. And there is the potential, I think, for PPS to share it, hopefully sometime in the near future with defence. Can you give me some idea of where we're at with that and, and how quickly that can happen? Um, so there, there, there's a project called the Managing Digital Evidence Project um, and it's overseen by the Department of Justice. And there are three phases to it. So the first phase involves police um, sharing material um, over what you've heard the term box, I think probably quite a lot over the last few weeks, which is this cloud based storage system. So please um, upload the material to box and then a link is sent to the PPS and the PPS are able to view it. Okay, so that's the first phase and that has gone live. And I know there's detailed work on, uh, being undertaken at the moment to maybe iron out some of the PPS issues that you might expect with a new process like that. Um, but that, you know, it is, it's proceeding at a pace and I know that um, significant improvements have been made. The second stage of the process is us having our own uh, cloud-based system. So there'll be a second box, if you like, a PPS box, and we can upload the uh, digital material to that box. And the second stage involves us being able to do that, but then also being able to use that to display digital evidence at court. So that reduces the need for us to bring a disk to court in order to display the evidence. And then the third phase of the project is involves sharing the digital evidence with the defense. Um, and that, well, since the third phase, I think you're, you're quite right to focus on it. It is an important um, phase, and I think the importance of it is never more true than I think in, under the current circumstances in which we're all working. Um, but already there has been engagement um, with the Law Society, and I believe the Power Council as well, um, certainly meetings with the Law Society to try to um, start the conversations around that. But it's quite a complicated process. Um, these are quite significant IT changes. Um, there are a number of sort of data protection and G GDPR considerations. Um, there are IT issues. There are issues around authentication. So making sure that the defendant, whenever they access a link, that it is the solicitor um, and you know not somebody else, and that the access is to the right material, to the file that's on their case, uh, and not something else. So I know it's quite a complicated project. Um, in terms of, of time scales for the completion of stage three. Uh, I'm not sure that I can give you anything definitive on that, um, unless there's anything that you're aware of, Francesca, that is... No, there's no... Um, I know that in the, in the department's digital justice strategy, I think it talks about March 2022, but I know that we have all really been working towards, hopefully, a date um, considerably before then, and certainly it's something that we would like to progress with as much pace as possible, because there are undoubtedly benefits both for ourselves and for the defence. Listen, thank you very much, and, and Chair, thank you for, for giving me a wee bit of leeway to ask that question, but I think maybe it's something we need to get a, a, a written briefing from the department on as well, if, if we can ask for that also. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll take a note of that point as a, as a kind of separate issue that we could pursue with the department. Um, I, can I bring in Gordon Dunn at this stage? Thanks very much for your presentation. Michael and Francesca, we, we really, really appreciate your input. Um, you may have heard our earlier discussion with the Bar Council, and I, I raised the point about progressing of cases. Uh, who is responsible for, I suppose, number one, prioritising them, and number two, uh, about progressing them on a, on a regular basis? Um, 
we've heard a lot from the bar council about other bodies um about the delays and forensics about the police about dna evidence and so on and all of these things can take up to a year but what has been done uh, through yourselves through pps uh, about on a regular basis liaising with these people what has been done to try and encourage them to put more resources into resolving these issues uh, to date. So I appreciate your comments. I did notice, Francisca, that you mentioned um, that as a result of this review, there would be a robust case management by judges. How do you think that would impact on the whole issue of progressing cases through the courts? Well, I'll try to maybe offer some comments on the prioritisation on the, on the general pro uh, progressing of cases. First of all, maybe and then Francesca wants to add, I don't think she, she, um, she can do so. But I mean, in terms of prioritization, there's a, a range of factors that, that play into that. Um, some cases are charged and are before the court, and therefore somebody is being remanded, either in custody or on bail. And that will be a relevant factor in deciding whether a case, um, I suppose, case is higher in terms of prioritization particularly if somebody is in custody. Um, there will be other factors, um, such as the vulnerability of any defendants or witnesses. So we seek to prioritize cases involving news, um, and also young defendants as well. Um, in terms of prioritizing certain investigative actions, um, so you mentioned forensic reports, for example. Um, now obviously, if the case is one that's um, prioritized for the reasons that I've just mentioned, that will play into it. Um, I'm not particularly um, across the detail of um, how, uh, or sort of what framework uh, FSNI have, or even maybe police cybercrime have, um, in terms of how they prioritize their work. I know there was a criminal justice inspectorate report that dealt with uh, e uh, cybercrime on the e-crime unit. But they will no doubt you know, prioritize work you know, depending upon the case type, whether it's sexual offences or whether it's maybe a national security case. Um, so there are a number of different factors that can play into prioritization. In terms of actually progressing it, um, you know, if it's, it's ultimately it's, it's a responsibility of the prosecution team, I think the police and the investigator, to try to ensure that evidence is made available as quickly as possible. Um, and then if the case is a charge case and it's before the court, the court will be seeking to ensure that the, that the case is progressing towards the committal hearing. So the court will also have, have a role in, in managing that. Um, some things that, we, that we've done in order to try to um, speed some of those processes up. Um, we have, uh, it came out of the indictable cases pilot um, back in 2015, but we have an initiative that's been with us for some time now called Proportionate Forensic Reporting. So whenever we do have a case that requires forensic evidence, we don't go for the full detailed witness statement as a first step. They have a number of stages of reporting, so it allows the forensic science service to produce a much more uh, concise report, which will hopefully be adequate for uh, a number of purposes. And it's only maybe if it becomes either it's a very serious or complex case from the outset, or if at a later stage it becomes clear that this is going to be contested evidence, that the forensic science agency would be required to invest more time in the case and provide a more, a more detailed report. Um, so that's one thing that we've tried to do to speed up the forensic um, side of the house. Both, uh, the indictable cases pilot that I mentioned earlier has been the main initiative that we've done to try to progress um, serious cases. Um, I touched on it earlier. Um, it uh, applies to murder cases, manslaughter cases, serious assaults, um, serious drugs cases. Um, we've had, we certainly had a lot of success with that in the pilot, um, where it was dealt with uh, um, by small teams in a particular area. It's been more challenging on, on, on a rollout basis. Um, and some of the reasons for that are the fact that it is, in a biased nature, voluntary. And so that's where we see one of the big advantages to these proposed reforms, is that if we can get cases into the Crown Court, and then we can have a Crown Court supervising, and this maybe just touches upon the case management point, if we can then have a Crown Court judge um, supervising the parties and it potentially have things like uh, duties of direct engagement built into any rules. We see that as a very significant step in terms of addressing delay. Um, 
the fantastic kind of thing. No, I think that touches on the robust case management by tolling the parties to account and narrowing issues where possible. Um, it's really what we're looking for. Yeah, I think that's that's important. I like that holding to account. Uh, I think that's that's critical. Uh, you know, the previous um, response I got from Michael didn't talk about anyone being held to account or having any sort of estimated target dates for for gathering of evidence. I think that's what what needs to be done is a focus on on target dates and trying to meet meet targets. Targets that haven't been mentioned here at all, but. Um, I think how how do you see uh, judge, sorry, you know, crown court judges having the resources, the time, and whatever to to progress cases and through case management. Yeah, I, I think the key to that is that uh, principle that I mentioned earlier a moment ago: fewer, more effective hearings. Um, so the way. Um, Obviously, England and Wales have been working a similar system for about 20 years. Um, the Better Case Management Handbook that, that I mentioned um, earlier really explains how they seek to achieve that. And I, I don't think there's any doubt that certainly in the initial hearing, um, they, they consider that any first hearing in a Crown Court sorry, um, should, slight IT issue on our side, um, should take at least 20 minutes. There should be direct engagement between the parties in advance, and there should also be. Um, you know, a form completed that shows exactly the issues that have been agreed. The prosecutors at that stage should also share as much um, evidence as they can. But then the, the, key, the key to the Crown Court judges, I think, um, having enough time is that we don't continually come back to court every four weeks. We, um, we have um, detailed directions that set out the time scales when it's, which, within which certain actions must be taken. And then you can have administrative support for call case progression officers we monitor compliance between the parties. And it's only if we get into a compliance issue um, that can't be resolved. Again, some issues can be hopefully resolved administratively, you know, even with judicial involvement, without having to come back to the court. But we need to change so that we have that different way of working where we're really using the judicial time as effectively as possible. OK, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, we'll bring Rachel Woods in for the next questions. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for your presentation. And again, a number of my questions have already been answered, but um, in your submission, you state that analysis is ongoing in relation to the impact upon resources for each of the affected agencies with regard to this uh, proposed bill, including yourselves. Um, have you any information on that and who's conducting it? Um, also, legal aid reforms were mentioned there and also in the submission and in particular in relation to clause four of the bill. Could you elaborate on the effects of legal aid that this change could have? I'll perhaps cover resources and uh, leave uh, legal aid to the deputy director. But uh, in terms of resources, we're currently working with the department to try and uh, look at costing um, the, 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 the uh, impact that the bill will have. Um, one of those uh, matters will be the expansion to the all indictable offences that is proposed, um, as that will bring in other investigative agencies and across the range of um, PPS teams. Um, and that's one aspect we're looking at. And obviously, key to that is ensuring that we have the right people with the right skills and the right role, um, and looking at um, redressing where possible if there are proposed uh, impacts on the magistrate's court and, uh, and then a proposed impact on the crowd. How will that look internally? Um, and that's something we're working on. Um, and it, it, it is still at a preliminary stage, as you can imagine. It, involves some modelling, um, both by the department and ourselves, uh, to get a real understanding of where there, there may be pressure points. Um, the deputy director has touched on new rules, for example, like case progression officers, and a pilot has, has been conducted into that and the importance of that. And we certainly recognise the importance in any direct committal process in terms of the compliance. So that work is ongoing, and I believe the department are currently modelling um, the impact on the courts, for example, and we will be feeding into that um, as it moves along. Yeah, I think obviously we have a set of legal aid rules that um, applies to the processes as we now have them. So we're going to have a completely different 
set of processes around compatible linear fences. Cases are going to arrive in the Crown Court a lot more quickly. Counts that are going to be instructed a lot more quickly. The types of hearings that are going to happen are going to be different. So all of that needs to be factored into a revised scheme. And I suppose the payments that are ultimately settled in relation to the different types of hearings and so on can impact upon the overall cost. Um, I think the other thing that's perhaps important around this, just on, on the context of legal aid, is that, I think I said in my submission, it's important that the defence are um, properly remunerated, there's no doubt, um, and for work that needs to be done up front at an early stage of the case. Um, but it's also important that the scheme um, incentivizes the early resolution of, of issues. And I think it would be our view that currently the legal aid scheme um, is something that we find maybe doesn't work uh, to our advantage in that respect because we have a system um, that has a certain payment called a guilty plea one fee for a case that pleads guilty without a trial date being fixed. And we have a second payment called a guilty plea two fee that is payable if a trial date is fixed. Now, whenever we did some analysis of this in terms of our own set, uh, payments to council um, a year or two ago, uh, they indicated that the guilty plea two fee was on average twice what a guilty plea one fee is. Now, it happens at a later stage of the proceedings, and so quite often there's additional work that has been done. But the way the system works, the fee is calculated in a different way. So it's arguably not that helpful to have a system that pays twice as much when a case is resolved after a trial date has been fixed, as opposed to one that is re resolved perhaps on arraignment, you know, the first appearance when a trial date isn't fixed. So that's just something else that um, we think is an important aspect of the reforms. So it's important to see fee the fee structures must be fair, they must reflect the, work's done, the, the work is done, but we have to be careful that there isn't something that creates an, an incentive that works against what we're trying to achieve. Appreciate that. Uh, open open the box of legal aid um, reforms and issues. <laughs> we could be here all day. Um, do you think then that this uh, this bill needs to go further with regard to setting out the parameters of what would be required for legal aid reform, or would that need to be done separately? I, th I think that's a separate, detailed um, piece of work. I know. I think um, the current committal reform program has four strands. Like one of them is legal aid. So legal aid is right up there, front and centre, as part of the work that is ongoing. Um, and as I understand it, there'll need to be detailed work and there'll be a consultation process around legal aid reforms. Uh, and that is one of the, probably you know, the most significant bits of work. Obviously all the work, operational work that I talked about earlier around better case management, but legal aid piece around federal reform is another very significant bit of work that requires to be done. Thank you. Um, Chair, I do think that that's something that we need to keep mindful of, especially um, when we're looking at this piece of legislation in terms of costings and unintended costings or indeed intended costings. Um, in terms of the um, English and Welsh uh, I suppose model and the committal reform had been in there for a a while and a, a abolition of committal proceedings. Have you had conversations or discussions with um, CPS on how that is working? Um, and do you think that that is the best model that we could have? Yeah, I think we've had a number of conversations over a period of years actually ar ar around this. And I know um, some of the senior CPS um, figures who were involved in delivering it um, have come over and presented at uh, different times, um, both to ourselves and, and to the department. Um, and we also would have relationships with some council in England as well, and we would have an opportunity to speak to them. So, um, I, I, I think and I have to say, I think a lot of that pressure is going to fall upon police and the prosecution. Um, but in terms of it being successful and getting cases on for trial more quickly, I think. And it's very difficult to compare data across the jurisdictions because it's, it's recorded differently in, in some respects. But I think in relation to those indictable only cases that get directly transferred, I've got to be careful here because I don't have any figures you know, that I can back this up with. Um, but it'll be my understanding that they do get to trial significantly quicker than the very serious cases that take place here. I mean, we have cases sometimes here under the current system can take several years to get to trial. Um, 
and um, obviously that's um, deeply unsatisfactory for us all. Um, whereas in England and Wales, this is a little bit anecdotal, obviously, but you sometimes see their very high profile uh, cases and you hear about them in, in the news and it's in the same calendar year maybe that you hear about them getting the trial. Um, I think that's only possible because they have abolished committal and they do take those cases into the Crown Court uh, and they apply very robust case management to them. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. It is, it is different. Um, the whole setup is different. The whole case management setup um, is, is different. Um, I just know, just in the in the response, you know, we're in a lot of um, different consultees are talking about comparisons with England and Wales and comparisons with other countries, um, but we don't don't know, um, can't say for certain. So it was just to see what um, conversations you've had. But in ter lastly, for me. Um, the Law Society brought up issues involving the Bail Act, and that was in their written consultation, and we teased it out a little bit um, in the oral briefing just before um, yourselves, and having time limits built into the system, um, and in terms of preparing cases, but also in terms of dealing with cases in the court system, so there's sort of two aspects of it. And I think when Gordon touched upon it earlier on about having targets, and targets are all well and good and, and time limits are all well and good, but if they're never going to be met, they are then become completely redundant and ineffective. Um, so I'm a bit unsure on this and I don't think it's as black and white or as easy to say that if we had targets that were met and limits that would be met, but it, or meet the interests of people who are in the justice system and the, and the victims um, or perpetrators and alleged um, ones that are involved but i'm hoping to get your opinion on that first of all on uh, if you have any any opinions on the bail act extending regulations that we it's my understanding we currently have available to us in northern ireland but um they've never been um operationalized um, and also then getting getting targets and dealing with cases in the court system both in the magistrates and the crown uh, in terms of bail, um, I'm not particularly familiar. I, 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 I do know that you know, bail has a legislative basis in England and Wales, um, which doesn't exist here. Uh, but my understanding is that generally the principles that are applied to bail are largely similar. Right? So if somebody is remanded in custody, um, the defendant obviously can apply for bail and then they can renew their application for bail if there's a change of circumstances. And one of the most common reasons for a defendant um, in a second application for bail um, is the time that has passed. Okay, so delay in the cases will feed into the bail position in that way. So a defendant will be able to come before the court and say, I've been on remand for nine months, six months, 12 months, whatever it is, and um, I don't have a trial date yet. And um, the judge is generally quite sympathetic to that argument. And we'll, ultimately say that it's only reasonable to detain somebody in custody for a certain period of time. Um, so I think that, that, that's what I would say about bail. In relation to statutory time limits, I think I would um, agree with, I think, the sentiment that you were expressing. Um, I believe the Northern Ireland office certainly considered this at the time that they did their review. Um, I don't know if it's in the report, but I do recall actually being at a briefing where they were asked whether or not they thought that that was the way forward. And, they said no, we didn't think you know, that that was the way forward. And then also when Sir John Gillan looked specifically at statutory time limits um, in his review of serious sexual offences, um, he has a whole chapter dealing with delay. Um, and one of the aspects that he considered was statutory time limits. And uh, what, what he said was that the research suggests that they have a limited influence on reducing, reducing delays or the length of the criminal justice process. He said that extensions are common and the key reasons often relates to the key reason for extensions often relates to the defense requiring additional preparation time. Um, and then a paragraph uh, 9.184, he confirmed that he did not recommend them and that they have little or no impact other than to show their impotence. Um, so I think that's that's the danger with them. Um, you create statutory time limits. Um, they also seem to me to be potentially quite an inflexible. Rule. I mean, I suppose the flexibility is built in there, and that you have the, the application to extend. Uh, but cases come in all different shapes and sizes, and uh, complexities and issues, and so on. Um, and I suppose as a starting point, statutory time limits maybe don't quite uh, reflect the variety of cases that you can have. Thank you very much, Chair. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Sinead Bradley. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation so far. I'm just reading through this, and, and I, you know, the um, the objectives set out for the bill. It's very clear to see the pace around victims and your agreement there um, in the Gillen report. But what I'm really trying to hone in on now is to understand the pace where you're in agreement that there is or will be a realisation um, of a more efficient or faster um, process in terms of delivery. So what I'm hearing from you and taking from this is that you basically are saying, and please correct me if I'm wrong in this, but um, that proposal to go to the Crown Court earlier ensures that with a judge having an overseeing role, that it's likely that the parties involved will work more efficiently. Are you then suggesting from that that the delays are partially due to a body of inefficient work is being carried out at the moment. So, uh, yeah, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, are we trimming back um, on a lot of research or building of cases that that you feel maybe doesn't need to be there? Um, yeah. Every case, as I said earlier, goes through a committal proceeding at the moment, which involves um, the preparation of a set of committal papers, which requires all the statements, all the exhibits. And there's been a culture in Northern Ireland, it's a very adversarial system, and a culture in Northern Ireland has developed um, whereby um, the prosecution have learned to expect um, understandably robust challenge to their cases. And they're built to a very high standard. And that sometimes also includes obtaining evidence around continuity of exhibits and, and so on, sort of a real belt and, and braces approach. I think what we're seeking to do is, if we can get cases into the crime court, and I certainly don't mean to suggest that it's only for the, for the judges to do. You know, there are duties here for the prosecution and the defence, and, and I think they need to be mandatory duties. Um, but then I think the judge also complements that and plays an, an important role. But yes, what we're then seeking to do is not to waste any resources building cases that are ultimately going to be guilty pleas. And in those cases that are going to be contested, we focus the resources on the issues that are going to be the issues at trial. You know, we, 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 we work to identify what the issues between the parties really are. And that requires that engagement, that requires the defense maybe to show their hand a little bit more. I know we're not taking issue with that, but we are taking issue with this, um, rather than um, at present. Um, you know, there's maybe not that onus on the defense to come forward and say, uh, what their case is. Now, there is, at the moment, a uh, statutory obligation upon the defence to serve a defence statement, which sets out in general terms. Okay? But there are a couple of points I'd make about that. One is that that comes after the prosecution have fully built, built their case and got it to committal. Um, we build our case, we get it to committal, um, the case gets set for trial, we serve our initial prosecution disclosure, and the first time the defence are required to engage, um, it's within 28 days of us serving our prosecution disclosure. Now, in practice, we rarely get that engagement. Um, whenever we looked at a set of cases, um, we looked at a set of cases, I'm probably not sure I get my figures right on this every time, um, in a certain area where defence statements were due to be served um, within, um, so the 28 day time limit for serving the, the defence statement. Um, was going to expire within this, this month. We looked at two court areas, and in, in one court area, 30 defence statements were due but, you know, within that month, and in another court area, 59 were due. And in the first, we had one defence statement received on time, one out of 30, and in the second area, we didn't get any, but 59 defence statements. So I think, I mean, that's indicative of the cultural change that's required here. Um, and, and it can't be about the defence um, keeping their cards to their chest, um, serving a defence statement you know, a couple of weeks before trial, which unfortunately is what happens um, regularly at the moment. Um, what, what, what we need is um, you know, the defence have the right absolutely to contest every issue, um, but we want the judges to be making sure you know, that a, you know, a proportionate approach is being taken to cases. Um, and that's how we then, I think, dedicate our resources and the police that get their investigative resource to where it needs to be. 
Okay, thank you for that because I think that's maybe where um, I have questions around that. You know, there does appear to be. You're talking about that. There's no mandatory or currently no mandatory requirement for that level of engagement between the parties, and that that's maybe the missing piece in the committal process right now. It's not as formal a piece, but also it's hard to just brush over the fact that um, we are hearing that some of the delays in those um, reports might be investigatory, so they couldn't in good faith submit uh, a final uh, a report if the investigatory process hasn't completed. And I do wonder if, if um, because I, I don't see how that's resolved, I don't see how moving that body of work to a different place, if the investigatory piece hasn't been resolved, that defence report won't come any more quickly. Um, but what you're saying is that they, it may be more refined, that that might not actually be an area of contention and that that report wasn't worth waiting for anyway in some instances. But there may be some instances where that report is critical and unless the resource yeah. is there to, to get it. So I, I just am wondering, you know, that we're moving it into a more formal framework, but the problems might just carry over with it. Well, I think the formal framework gives us some of the opportunities that we don't have at the minute in the Magistrates Court. Um, and if we can maximise those opportunities, um, you're quite right, there will be cases where the expert report that is going to take a long period of time needs to be obtained, and, and that's fine. But if we resolve certain cases earlier, or if we find other contested cases, that uh, you know what, you know, we don't need a DNA report in that case, um, because you know, we have other evidence that the defendant accepts that they were there, and the defendant you know, will concede at an early stage, yes, I was there, but my defence is self-defence or something. We can then target the resources um, better towards those cases where ultimately these issues are going to be contested. So hopefully the idea is that you, you end up having less work within the system, and if that's the case, then you can potentially speed up the work that you do have because you, you can dedicate the resource that you have towards those cases. Okay. And is that a role then um, in terms of the PPS, you know, whenever you're looking at that threshold of evidence being there, do you have any part to play in trying to refine where the areas of contention might be in a case going forward? Um, not, not under the current system. Oh, we, I mentioned the ICP, the Available Cases Pilot, which is something that we have sought to do on, on a voluntary basis. And the idea of that is exactly that. So that there's engagement between ourselves and the, um, the police, and then engagement between ourselves and the defence. Um, but it, it's been a, a, a story of mixed um, sort of results in, in terms of the productivity of that. And as I say, the, the environment of the Magistrates Court isn't as conducive to that as the environment of the Crown Court. And one of the key reasons is cases in the you know, defence, there's no disadvantage to them. You're really sitting back, allowing, you know, not making any concessions at an early stage, maybe not too keen to make concessions because maybe they don't have the advice of their council or their senior council that they're going to have in the crowd court. Um, not really being disadvantaged in terms of sentence because they can wait and see the case against them, they can get their advice from their council, they can enter a guilty plea once they get into the crowd court if that's what they're going to do, and um, they can still, you know, make a powerful submission that they're entitled you know, to the credit for their guilty plea because it's the first opportunity that they have to enter it under the current system. Whereas if we can get the cases into the Crown Court and the defence um, uh, much earlier, and the defence can be asked to indicate their attitude to the case much earlier, then it becomes there's potentially more of a consequence for them if they say, no, 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 everything's contested here. Um, we want to put through the prosecution fully on its first and we're not conceding anything. Um, in, in those circumstances, if ultimately a, a plea is entered, then we would hope um, that the judge would make it quite clear that we are, this point would have been afforded if the plea had been entered at a much earlier opportunity. Okay. Thank you. And just one final um, point here. Is it fair to say that, you know, it would always have been my belief that the further up through the judicial system you go, the more expensive a place it is to be? And is it fair to make the assumption that um, a case going to the Crown Court, even be it more refined and more efficiently tailored, could it build up um, 
while the time may be shortened, the costs may not? I think it depends upon all the issues that we mentioned earlier. Um, we can at this stage whether it's going to um, be cheaper, more expensive, or the same for ourselves as an organisation. And I don't think we can say at this stage whether it's going to be cheaper, more expensive, or the same for the system as a whole. Um, it'll depend on all the handling arrangements that there are for the Crown Court, all the supporting framework that there is around case management, the legal aid reforms you know, that are going to be required to go along with it. All of that needs to be worked through. Um, and then I think everyone will be in a better position to, to make a clear assessment around costs. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, Sinead. Well, the last one I have for this session is Paul Frew. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thanks very much for your information. Again, there is there is an echo and a, and a hollowness. Uh, it must be the room you're in with regards to the speaker system. So we were able to pick up some of that, but it's not 100% clear. So please forgive me if I go over old ground here with you, uh, and you've already answered some of these questions, uh, because by no means am I an ex expert in this, and I'm trying to uh, educate myself as we go along with all these uh, uh, witness statements. Can I take you back to the, and again, a number of the members have stated this around the, the talk about, uh, you know, what, what is the motives for this bill? If it's delay, then it won't actually work. Uh, if, it's, if it's to save uh, witnesses going through the shock trauma of a court case or, or, or a second evidence session, then it, it, it is certainly worthy of consideration. Let me take you to the the, the delay piece, because I think that we shouldn't be missing a trick here with regards to this legislation uh, in, in what we can do to affect change. So, given what we've heard, and there seems to be an, a, a massive issue around delays at the investigatory stage, i.e. the police stage and the PPS stage, gathering up the file and the evidence within to prosecute. Um, is that unfair in your eyes with regards to the procedure that then comes afterwards? Uh, you know, what, what's your thoughts on that? Is it unfair to heap the blame onto the likes of yourself? I think it's important that we recognise that there are issues around the investigation um, and the prosecution side of it that, that can be improved. Okay, and that's very much what we're seeking um, to work on uh, um, through a number of different initiatives and, and uh, there's a lot of joint working that goes on with the police uh, around that. Um, I think we've, we've actually got ourselves on the camera here, but hopefully everything's still working. Well, maybe that's we're, we're on speaker mode. Um, so the idea, and I think I'm at risk of repeating myself here, but I know you, you said you didn't mind if I, if I did. Um, the idea is that we, if we can get the cases into, into the Crown Court um, and we have uh, a system that encourages early identification of key issues, um, that we ensure that we focus the resource where it needs to be. Um, so those uh, bits of evidence that take um, longer to get, um, we only get them when we need to. Yeah. And cases that can be dealt with by way of a guilty plea, the guilty plea um, can be sort of eased out of the parties, shall we say, um, a lot earlier than it is. So that, that gets that case dealt with and it gets it out of the system and frees up time and resource for everybody to focus on the other cases. Um, and then those that aren't going to result in a guilty plea, um, we make sure that only those lines of inquiry that are relevant to the issues of, between the parties are pursued. Um, and that we don't have a situation where we're building cases unnecessarily. I think proportion, proportionality yeah. um, is, is, is key to this. Um, and, and surely, so, surely what, what you're talking about there is a leaner, meaner machine at the judicial side of things. Surely you as a PPS will always have to be thorough and look at every angle of a case going forward. To, to, to ensure to ensure that you're satisfied that you're going to there's a there's a you know your evidential tests are going to be met.
Sorry, you're gone with sound. I can, I can hear, I can see you, you moving and your lips moving, but we've lost sound. Are we gone? It sounds like it. Well, I, I, I can, I, I think you can still hear me. Uh, we can't hear you at all. But, but I suppose one question I will leave to you, and if you can hear us, then you can maybe come back to us, and that is, what would a, an acceptable statutory time limit be for the PPS? Uh, and, and what could you actually deliver and achieve uh, on making sure that there's, it doesn't affect uh, safe prosecutions? Uh, I'll leave it there, because I don't think we can uh, communicate now the problem seems to be on their side, not our side. Yeah. Okay. We need to no. hang up well, we've, and reconnect. We've lost the sound there, so Paul, we can follow that question up in writing. So um, members will will move on. That was the last question uh, members had anyway. Um, so we covered quite a lot of ground there with the PPS. And let me just thank them for their evidence to the committee at this stage. And uh, again, there'll be a summary provided of this session of areas. Uh, to then go back to the department in respect of that issue. So thank you, members, for that, and to the PPS. OK, um, let's move on then in terms of uh, item six, protection from the stocking bill, proposals for a committee stage. It's uh, pages 56 to 63. The protection from stocking bill has been now referred to the committee to undertake the committee stage of the bill. Uh, so a provisional timetable for the committee stage of the bill will be provided uh, before the end of February. Um, in the meantime, there's proposals to seek written evidence, and they have been provided for members uh, today. Uh, it is good practice when seeking written evidence on a bill for a committee to issue a media signposting notice, inviting organisations or individuals with an interest in the bill to submit written evidence and also to write to key stakeholders a draft media signposting notice to be placed in the three main newspapers uh, and on the Assembly website is provided at page 58 of the meeting pack. The link to the committee webpage notice will also be advertised on the committee's Twitter account. Um, it's proposed that the closing date for receipt of written submissions will be Friday the 16th of April. Uh, this takes into account the Easter period. There's a draft list of key stakeholders to which it is proposed that the committee would write um, and that's provided on pages 59 to 61 of your meeting pack. The list includes stakeholders uh, who provided substantive responses to the consultation exercise carried out by the Department of Justice on the policy proposals contained in the bill, as well as organisations who provided responses to the committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. And a draft letter to stakeholders inviting written evidence is in the meeting pack, pages 62 and 63. So if members are content then with the date of uh, Friday the 16th of April uh, for receipt of uh, written evidence, then that would be the date that we would use. And if members are content to agree, the draft media sign uh, posting notice, uh, notice and also uh, to agree the list of key stakeholders that's being invited to submit written evidence um, and also to agree the draft letter to go to stakeholders. Are, are members agreeable to all of those different action points? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Um, so, members, there will be an electronic bill folder that will be set up um, on the uh, electronic system, and that will contain the bill, the explanatory memorandum, uh, the background policy papers, research papers, written submissions, and then other documents um, associated with this piece of legislation, and that will allow members uh, easy access to the relevant uh, papers. We're also considering just how to encourage individuals who have experienced stalking behaviour to share their experiences and provide their views on the legislation to the committee, and then proposals will be brought to the committee on this. So, members, we will bring a uh, beyond the agreement uh, on the written submission. We'll obviously uh, need to get a timetable together uh, for when the bill can be. Um, considered by the committee. Um, as members know, you need to then go to the Assembly. Um, and you can only do that once in terms of the uh, period and time that you're seeking to extend 
uh, that committee scrutiny uh, stage. Obviously, with um, the, the date of uh, the end of April um, for receiving written evidence, uh, the time that you would consider that. It will not be before the summer recess um, that we will have this bill completed. It will be uh, near the end of this year because we have already got the committal reform bill. Um, that has to be completed by the middle of June. Uh, we also are likely to receive the uh, larger Criminal Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, uh, indicative for uh, some time in March. And then, obviously, it's the Personal Injuries uh, uh, Bill as well. So it may well be that this committee is, ha has four pieces of legislation to consider, uh, and obviously we're already stretched uh, in terms of our bandwidth. The COVID regulations is also making it very difficult for this committee, in my view, to be able to conduct its business as effectively and efficiently as I would like, albeit we're doing very well. So bear that in mind, members, when we come with the timetable on the stocking bill. Um, it will not be before the summer recess. It will be into the next uh, beyond that. Um, and we need to take into account the likelihood of having two more bills brought in. And we can only ask the Assembly once in terms of uh, a date, I would much rather build in as much flexibility and then work back from that. And if we can expedite matters more quickly, um, the, the date for extension is never, in my view, the date that you work to. Uh, it is only there as an ultimate fail-safe um, that allows the committee to manage its responsibility. So I'll have discussions with the clerk of the committee in advance of next week. We'll hopefully be a little bit clearer as to the intentions of the minister on the, uh, the other bills, uh, and then we'll come forward with proposals on that basis for members to consider next week. So item seven, uh, in terms of the Crown Court, uh, the rules, this, this one's uh, a procedural rule, so it's, it's for noting, but there was a statutory rule that makes amendments to the uh, Crown Court rules, taking account of provisions in the a Crime Act of 2019. The 2019 Act empowers the Crown Court to require production of or access to stored electronic data directly from a person or company located outside of the United Kingdom, as it uh, would if the information were located in or controlled by a company within the UK. An amendment inserts the procedure for making application for orders under this Act and the manner in which such applications will be considered into the Crown Court rules. The statutory rule will also reinsert rules relating to telephone hearings uh, under the uh, Crime Act of 2003, which erroneously omitted the criminal procedure um, regulations of 2019 into the principal rules. So the rules were drafted by the Office of the Lord Chief Justice. It was agreed and made by the Northern Ireland Crown Court Rules Committee, and Crown Court rules, when uh, made, must be submitted to the relevant authority, which were expected matters, as is the case with the 2019 Act and the 2003 Act, uh, means the Lord Chancellor. So the statutory rule is procedural in nature, and it isn't subject to any procedures of this Assembly, and therefore it's there for noting by members, unless anyone is wanting further information, um, then we will duly note it. Okay, noted. Yep. Item 8. Uh, at our meeting on the 14th of January, the committee considered the proposal by the Department uh, of Justice for a statutory rule to amend Order 97 of the Rules of the Court of Judicature to enable applications in non-contentious probate cases to be made online, uh, replace the sworn affidavit with a statement of truth, and make changes to the making of exhibits and agreed to seek clarification on a number of issues, including why an applicant is currently required uh, to travel to Belfast or Londonderry, uh, what the differences are between a sworn affidavit and a statement of truth, and if there will be any legal implications from the change, the process to determine whether a case is contentious, and who makes such a determination, and whether fees may be charged for applications in the future. So the Department has responded, providing that further information on these issues. It's in the correspondence of pages 86 to 89. Uh, the statutory rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure. So, members, uh, in light of the further information uh, that has been provided by the Department, uh, are we content with the proposal for the statutory rule, or is there any further clarity needed from members? Chair. Yes, Linda. 
Um, no, I'm, I'm not seeking clarity but before going ahead it and supportive of it on the basis of the responses. I'm just actually seeking a timeline as to when it might be in place because obviously with COVID it would be helpful the sooner the better. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what the timeline will be and that's information we can just seek whilst going ahead with it. Okay. Well, if, if members are content, we can indicate that to the department and then we'll ask for them uh, to provide us the time frame for laying the the appropriate statutory rule um, and when then that will come into legal effect. So we'll do that and we'll, we'll provide that information back to the committee. Okay, members, thank you on that item. Item 9 then, the draft budget 2021-22 committee uh, draft response. So following the oral briefing last week on the department's uh, budget settlement, uh, the draft settlement was agreed uh, for a draft committee response to the Committee for Finance. Uh, summarising the key issues discussed with officials would be prepared for consideration at this meeting. The draft response was circulated to members yesterday and has also been included in the uh, tabled pack. So members hopefully will have had a chance just to take a look at it. It just covers the issues in a general sense and highlights a number of the issues then that were raised uh, by members. So, members, in terms of the, the draft response, if there's no additional changes or amendments that members wish to make, are we agreed that we'll provide that response to uh, the Committee for Finance? Linda? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm content with the committee response, Chair. I have to say I have real concerns with some of the responses that came back to us from other organisations. Um, you know, for example, PSNA, and 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 I note that the three big challenges for PSNA are all money that should have came from the British government, and that is the additional office, officers through NDNA, the EU exit funding, which last year when we had no exit, was fifteen and a half million, and this year is reduced by six million, which to me is just absolute madness. But. Um, and then obviously in relation to the failure to set up the historical investigations unit which has a massive impact on current day um, current day placing and I have a number of concerns just in relation to the probation board as well now I don't think I mean obviously this is a these are written responses but the, there are a number of questions that I would like to put to um, the department and the probation board and I'm content for written answers on them but I will I, I can forward those to Christine just to to try and get responses in relation to them because there there are a lot of concerns raised. I mean, for example, one of the issues they've raised is, is the not having adequate PPE. Was there a business case put in for PPE? Did the minister then bid in to the Department of Finance in relation to that and the COVID monies? So why have they not got adequate PPE, given that there has been a substantial amount of money um, put back into the centre and, and sitting there without being drawn down? So just it's just an update because there may well be updates in relation to some of this stuff. You know, perhaps the minister has since put in something. Um, and again, then just big concerns around the ability for the probation, probation board to deliver. Um, and I want definitely want an update in relation to the Aspire and Engage programs, um, because I mean, particularly around that Engage program and ensuring that women are supported in communities and and are not left vulnerable to um, control of criminal gangs. And I think Pitt Park last week was was a very good example of of that particular issue because. I don't think anybody's under any illusions what that was about and it was about intimidating a family and it was particularly about intimidating women and family who were brave enough to stand up against these criminal elements so I, I would I would have big concerns around the, the impact of a reduced budget particularly on, on some of those issues with the probation board so I, I can forward those questions to Christine to, to go to both department and probation board Okay, that would be helpful. Um, let me bring in Emma Rogan and then Gemma Dolan. Thanks, um, Chair. Mm. My question is also around the um, probation board and the reduction in their workforce. 
um, it's more or less what impact will that have on the rehabilitation of of prisoners and the reintegration of prisoners into society you know we all can see if someone's in in prison they're there for punishment for whatever crimes but but key to that is rehabilitation and and key reintegration into, into society so the outcomes of that for for the betterment of society and for victims and for prisoners that that i would have serious concerns around that okay um Gemma dolan Thanks, Chair. I don't have a question, just more a comment. Um, and again, it is around the probation board as well. Um, they're talking about the reduction in staff. Um, I think they said the only way they can meet the pressures is to reduce headcount. And inevitably, that's going to bring extra pressure on the current staff. And I'm party spokesperson on workers' rights, so I'd be really concerned about the staff wellbeing, the current staff wellbeing. Um, and we know what the... the um, percentage of staff in the civil service are off on um, sick leave due to stress. So I'd be concerned here as well that we'd have a similar knock on effect here. But um, yeah, it's just, it just takes me, makes for grim reading. Okay, thank you. Um, Rachel Woods. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just not to labour the points all been, all been raised, but with regard to the probation board and the effects of uh, funding cuts then on the community and voluntary sectors that they fund, um, to deal with people and again we, I know we touched on it last week um, with the lack of a quality impact assessment I find that quite difficult whenever I'm reading their response in particular but also and whenever we're looking at the um, PRRT response um, given we've just supported and signed off on strategy which involves increasing PRRT how, how is this going to work if they're reducing um, and have an impact on fun, frontline service delivery. So certainly would, lo would love some, some answers to that. Uh, the PPE, again, like Linda raised, that was concerning. And then the PSNI reduction of, of headcount and, and reduction of, um, in, um, in getting new officers in. And, and that, that just goes against everything that was supposed to be a new decade, new approach, and that um, parties had signed up to. And the funding deficit, um, the policing board as well. I mean, I just think, it, as Gemma said, it makes for grim reading, and we think we need to get a bit more detail from the department of what's happening with that. Okay, um, Sinead Bradley. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. I'm not going to leave at the points that have been made, but you know, we're looking at this from the justice family's perspective, and it's not good. It's really not good, and when you add to that, um how out of step this is to new decade, new, new um, approach and all sort of previous agreements and that is so out of step and I and I just do wonder um, this sort of capture of all these bodies, um, this needs to be thrashed out, you know, beyond us at executive level um, to see how far, you know, we're moving further away from any targets we've had um, or ambitions that we've had and I just do wonder if we have a duty just to ensure that this is being brought to executive level, warts and all, um, because the detail in these responses is quite grim. There's no 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 other expression we could use to describe them. Thanks, Chair. And um, Gordon Dunn. Sorry, Gordon, if you just unmute. Not sure why we're not here in Gordon just at this stage. Gordon, I'll come back to you and we'll see what that is. Um, Paul Frew. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Again, looking at the overall budget, uh, it seems to be the Department of Justice is the only department that has actually put... Uh, now, again, it's scant detail, it's only headline stuff, but at least they have made the effort in putting down five uh, programme for government commitments and indicators, uh, whereas most of the other departments have not. And that brings me to my point also in that we have never ever had a budget that has aligned with a programme for government and we've never had a programme for government that has aligned with the budget. And these two must be read together or else it just will not work. And then throw into the mix also the fact we now have a consultation out at the minute for a fresh programme for government, a brand new programme for government. 
Now, I don't know, I haven't had a chance to look in detail at how different that new programme for government is, but there is just no way that we can keep on proceeding going down this road without a bit of a purpose programme for government, which is, which is populated with finance and in a budget that is, that is overarched with a programme for government. It's just nonsensical. It just cannot be. It's, what those two items are are the two sides of a coin. And if you don't have that one side, you'll not have the coin. So it's, 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 just, it's just really bad form in going forward where we have hadn't had the time to actually populate the budget on line with Programme for Government and then vice versa. And that and an, an overall piece is just, is, just, is just bad form and wrong. And it's a recipe for disaster. It really is, because in, in producing a fit-for-purpose programme for government, you will force departments to work together. If you force departments to work together, inevitably you will, you will save money. Not only that, you will become more effective. And if you do not have that pressure being applied, you will just keep going on the way we are in silos. So it's all going to cost money until we get to grips with it all. So that's an overall piece, Chair, but not necessarily justice related. Uh, but justice will be justice will be the victim because justice is one of our three big beasts of departments, uh, alongside health, which is the biggest, of course, and then education. Uh, justice is in there, uh, so it needs to be resolved sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, and Gordon Dunn. Gordon, we have you on mute still. That's you. Yeah, do you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay, thank you. No, just quickly, the PSNA issue, the funding of it was mentioned in some detail last week, and we appreciate the report that was done there. Uh, I think we can be remiss of us not to highlight the, the cost of policing. 728.6 million is what is estimated at, plus uh, 31.2 million uh, for PSNI security funding takes it up to about £760 million. Pounds. Uh, and I believe, you know, I do think police need to look at how uh, they manage their resources and how effectively and how efficiently they manage them. We need more police and there's a strong argument for it. Police is a contentious issue, it's a difficult issue. And we need the police there and we need them to get on with their job in, in the most difficult circumstances. And I do also uh, you know, uh, emphasise the funding that's there for the tackling paramilitary programme. It's important that that's moved forward and we, and we can really get results from that because that has been talked about now for so long and we haven't seen enough evidence of success. So I think those two issues should be uh, re-emphasised, Chair. Thank you. Okay, members. Well, the, the draft response, if members are agreed with it, um, it, it needs to be with the committee. I think it was tomorrow is whenever they need it. Uh, the other issues members had raised previously, we're still waiting on the department to come back to the committee on. So you know, we'll take a note of these other issues that are being raised with members, um, but the department still hasn't come back to the initial uh, feedback that has been provided. So you know, we'll add these uh, into areas that need to be raised, but obviously given the budget, the way in which it's been introduced, the time frame for consideration, it has limited the scope of this committee and other committees to be able to carry out the kind of scrutiny work which is identifying all of these type of issues. So uh, to a certain extent, we're a prisoner of the framework that we're having to deal with, and that limits our capacity to, to probably do the kind of work that we would all want to do on this. So when we get the response from the department, um, these are issues that uh, there will be a note taken of what other members have raised. If there's particular issues, um, I know Linda's mentioned about providing them to the clerk, please do that um, so that we can go back again to the department in due course. So members, we'll agree to send then the response to the Committee for Finance. We'll so send it also to the Minister for Justice and also the Assembly Research Service. Uh, we'd appreciate a copy of it too for their information. Okay, members. Um, Item 10, there's an update on the implementation of the Gillen Review recommendations, pages 144 to 204. 
The Department officials attended our meeting on the 15th of October last year, provided an overview of the implementation plan of the recommendations in respect of serious sexual offences cases, subsequently provided further information on a number of issues. So the Department has now provided a written update on the progress since October to deliver the strategic priority areas. So, member, the update is there for members uh, to note. Um, we will request the, a further update, uh, another sixth monthly update uh, for September uh, later in this year uh, in order to ensure that there's still progress being made on this. Um, so, if members are can content, we'll note it. Um, I'm seeing five hands that are raised. I don't know if that's from the previous session or whether it's related to this one. So, if members want to lower their hand, um, if it's not related to this. So, Rachel, I still see your hand up, so I'll come to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, no, this is a good briefing. I am just wanting to point to education and awareness, and this was regarding um, relationship and sexuality education. No, we've discussed this a number of times, um, and it says at the bottom, I believe, in the meet pact 152, that the group is written to committee chairs, all party groups and political parties to ascertain the policy position on RSE in schools and the Gillen serious sexual offence recommendations. I wonder if there's any details about what political parties have been written to on this? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I do know um, under the correspondence section, um, I was going to come to this issue uh, because obviously the committee did write to the Department of Education around this, and I was going to suggest that we provide that response to the Gillen Review team, um, because they, I think they have written to, to this committee. Um, but I'm not sure the answer around political parties. Yeah, I suppose just if it um, was relating to all political parties, or is it the executive parties? Because there is no record of the Green Party Northern Ireland being communicated on this issue. So I would like um, like to know that, and also what all party groups have been discussed with as well. Okay. Well, I'm happy that we asked sure. that to, to find out, Linda. I was going to come in on, on this under correspondence, but I mean it, it's been dealt with now. So rather than going over the point at a later stage. I, I'm not sure either if, if our party is. I certainly haven't been notified and I'm somebody who's been very vocal on the issue. So I, I don't know, Rachel, what parties, even if our own party has, has got that correspondence. I, I agree with the, the committee forwarding that on, but I mean, I'm well on the record and I don't know how the committee feel about formally putting the committee on the record. I would certainly welcome, if, if we were in a position to do so, to say that we think that it is something that is extremely important. It is something that is coming out of the Gillen Review, but many, many other um, reports have talked to the importance of this. And, and I raised it again in the Chamber earlier in the week, I, I think probably two or three times, because for me, this is at the very centre and the very heart of everything we do around um, legislation for, you know, Domestic, but there's domestic abuse, sexual abuse, stalking, all of these things at the very, very heart of them. And the only way we're going to prevent it and ensure that we don't have to use that legislation to put people in prison is to start educating our young people genuinely and openly and properly and non judgmentally around what a healthy relationship looks like. And I think we need, we do need an agreed position right across the assembly on, on that. And we need to have a uniform approach, not different from one school to another and to teach a child about this is not to teach them i think we need to we separate the two things out it's not to teach them to have a sexual relationship it's to teach them about what a good healthy relationship looks like and try to ensure that that's what they hopefully will have in their lifetime but if we don't start educating our children now around this we're going to continue coming up against the same problems Okay. Um, well, in, in terms of Rachel, in the first instance, I'm happy that we would try to find out the reference around all parties, all party groups, you know, have they engaged uh, or in terms of that to, to see if we can find that out. I'm not aware of where the engagement has been, I suppose, with my own party like Linda in respect of that. Um, so if, if I can deal with that one first in respect of it, then um, 
at the correspondence, I'll maybe make a few other remarks um, because I probably disagree with Linda on this, but I'm happy to articulate a position in the correspondence section in terms of forwarding what we've already done to the Minister for Education, but just so that I can work through the agenda, um, I'll deal with that at the correspondence section whenever it comes up. So, members, if I can take us on to the item 11, Modern Slavery. At our meeting on the 28th of January, the committee considered a, a public sector consultation paper and a commercial sector engagement paper provided by the Department on the impact of intended amendments to the Modern Slavery Act to strengthen transparency and supply chain arrangements for commercial businesses and for the first time to extend them to apply to the public sector. The committee agreed to request clarification on what the differences are between engagement and consultation and why a full public consultation is not being undertaken for both the commercial and public sectors. The Department has now responded, outlining the rationale for the approach being used and indicating that going forward the intention is to refer to the private sector document as an engagement and consultation document. So if members are content to note um, the clarification that's been provided and then we'll consider the matter further when the results of the consultation are available. Members content? Content. Uh, committee Forward Work Programme, um, pages 283 to 292-292 uh, of the meeting pack for the relevant papers on the Forward Work Programme on 41 and 42 of the table pack, um, in terms of a letter from the Department requesting a change of date for two written papers. So the Department has provided a list of those items of business that it would like the Committee to consider at our meetings in March 2021. The Department has also written requesting the two written briefings currently scheduled for the meeting on the 25th um, on the results of the McLeod and Reforms to Pension Scheme consultations and mandatory retirement age for devolved office holders consultations be deferred until the meeting on the 25th of March due to a delay with the Ministry of Defence timetable and to enable coordination with the Department of Finance approach uh, to the Finance Committee on the Civil Service Pension Reform more generally. Uh, a space at the meeting on the 25th of uh, March has been kept free with the intention of scheduling a session for the committee to informally consider the provisions of the committal reform bill and the department's responses to the issues raised in the written and oral evidence if all the information is available at that stage. So further consideration of the proposed LCM relating to police crime and sentencing and court bills may also need to be scheduled for a meeting in March if the bill becomes available. So if members are agreeable, we'll schedule the work items requested by the department for the meetings in March, including deferring the two written papers currently scheduled for a meeting on the 25th of February. Uh, and also members just to advise the department has asked that an oral evidence session requested by the committee on a proposal for a stat rule scheduled for next week's meeting um, is held in closed session. There's a letter at pages 43 and 44 of the tabled pack. Um, the committee had considered a proposal for a statutory rule amending the criminal justice uh, rules of 2009 and that rule allows the department to designate organisations other than the probation board to supervise offenders on licence who pose a serious risk of harm to the public. The change is required to support a new model for managing terrorist related offenders. The committee had not previously received any information on the new model um, and as that was the case it was agreed that an, inf uh, that an oral briefing should be scheduled with departmental officials. The preference, of course, um, members, is that this committee uh, would always conduct its business in open session, particularly whenever it relates to legislation. In this case, however, the Department has requested that the briefing is held in closed session, that it is not broadcast or indeed reported by Hansard, and that officials' names are not made publicly available, including on the meeting agenda. The Department has advised that the request has been made on the basis that this is a sensitive operating environment and there have previously been threats to staff named as working in this area. Uh, they also do not wish to prejudice the development and delivery of new operational practice in an open forum. The Department considers that a closed session would enable officials to brief the committee without adversely compromising ongoing or potential operational, legal or safety issues associated with managing terrorist-related offenders. So, members, uh, if you're content with, um, in terms of the uh, schedule for March and the deferral of the two written papers to accommodate that, then we can agree to that. And then, obviously, I've outlined the basis on which the department wants to proceed with the oral uh, briefing. Um, if members are uh, content 
um, that we would proceed to receive that oral briefing, briefing on that basis. Um, we would do it. At the, okay, thank you, Linda. We, we'll do it at the start of the committee meeting, um, and then we can go into public session after that. Okay. Okay. Um, Correspondence. There's five items of correspondence, um, and I'll draw attention to one of them, uh, and that is the correspondence from the Gillen Review Implementation Team regarding a scoping exercise to ascertain the policy position of a variety of uh, stakeholders um, in respect of the relationship in sexuality education in schools and the relevant Gillen report around serious sexual offences recommendations. So, members, the committee previously had wrote to the Minister of Education requesting information on the role of the Department of Education and other education bodies in advising and educating young people on the criminal law in relation to sexual offences, including the age of consent for sexual relations. And members had noted the response at our meeting on the 14th of January. Um, so, if members are agreeable on that issue, and um, that we would send a copy of that correspondence uh, to uh, the review team, I suppose just on the the wider point, picking up uh, on what Linda has said, and and I don't disagree with um, a lot of what she has said, um, but it has been an area where I've came to it at this committee, looking at it from a justice perspective. Um, I'm not on the education committee, um, and therefore. It's not something that I have engaged in great detail as to considering um, what way the, ed the education department should be going about handling the RSE. I am on a board of governor of three schools, secondary and two primary, um, and I do feel that, uh, and, and this isn't a justice um, comment on this, but I do actually feel that it is for schools to take decisions in, in terms of this, um, having a kind of mandatory uniform system. I'm, I'm not sure uh, in terms of whether that's the best way or not. I don't have a fixed view on it, but I do feel that uh, my own view is uh, respecting the autonomy of individual schools around this. And I also believe there's a rule for parents uh, and schools are often um, put into a position where they're having to explain issues um, in what are sensitive issues and that comes into conflict with where some parents will be more than happy for their children um, to receive um, detailed kind of uh, relationship sexual advice and, and schools then have to usually engage with parents to get their permission uh, and there are some who will, won't do that and I respect parents autonomy in terms of what their children receive in respect of this. So that's just a kind of general observation that I make in, in respect of some of the different areas in consideration on this. I, I have no difficulty with what the committee had done um, in terms of raising it with the Education Minister and, and forwarding that on, but I, I wouldn't be in a position um, to, to support a Universal Justice Committee position uh, as to what exactly we would be asking schools um, to do and the Minister for Education to do on this, because I feel that's more a role for the Department of Education, the Committee for Education, and all of the different stakeholders within the education family to, to try and come to a position on this, rather than me being able to give a clear position as to what exactly the, the outcome for that should be. So I just make that general comment in respect of where, where I and my colleagues on the committee would be on it. I'm not sure, Linda, sure. if you want to come back to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no I, I accept entirely what you're saying, that that it, it, it is more an education committee issue. I have no problem with that. I would have loved that this committee could have responded because whilst I accept what you're saying about you know parental responsibility, and I certainly take my parental responsibility seriously, one of the big issues that we found in going through legislation is that there lies the very problem that where domestic abuse is going on in a home, how can those parents be able to teach those young people what a healthy relationship looks like? Maybe through no fault of their own, certainly through no fault of the, of the victim in terms of the domestic abuse, but very often maybe through no fault of the perpetrator either because they, they're, they're doing what they've seen themselves all of their lives. And, and therein lies the problem. They were, never, they were never taught themselves what a healthy relationship looked like. They were never taught how to manage their emotions or their feelings. Or, so I, that's, that's at the core for me, why, why everybody needs to be taught uniformly. 
what a what a healthy relationship looks like and it is important that it's done in a non-judgmental non way because that in itself leads to some of the, the very difficult issues that that we have and challenges that we have around some justice issues but i accept where you're coming from and i accept that we won't have a committee view on this i think rachel's question as to um how the parties have been contacted probably will be relevant then in, in terms of responses as parties so thank you chair okay um Sinead bradley yes thanks chair chair and um, i do agree i have to say with the the emphasis being on education clearly around this and even the, the gillen report you know the extract of recommendations repeats that throughout you know the department of education department of education but in terms of um there being you know, it does have to be steered through the, de the Department of Education because whilst there might be broad agreement on a lot of issues and there's a long way to travel in this conversation about a healthy relationship before there would be any divergence on views, particularly young children online and what they're being exposed to and all the dangers that come with that. So, so I think there's a, a huge shared space and responsibility in terms of... Um, reaching those children and school is the obvious vehicle to do in that. Um, that said, you know, one of the recommendations does explicitly refer to the Department of Justice and the Department of Education. So it has been identified that there is a role within the Department of Justice, um, just, and, and I'll quote the one of was 52, where they talk about speedily drawn up plans for awareness campaigns through schools. Now, you know, we're talking about the very basics and people might agree on what is age appropriate and what's not, but this is the very, very basics of what a healthy relationship looks like. And like I say, I think we could talk for a long, long time on agreeing what a healthy relationship looks like for that age profile before there be any divergence on views. So I think there is a healthy space there that we could occupy and, and play a part in in terms of trying to work with the Department of Education where we can and moving this along that it just doesn't sit idle and that nobody takes ownership of it or that the Department of Education no doubt will have to work with unions and uh, find out where in curriculum space they would have for this but I think we, we definitely have a role to play. I don't think it's the lead role but I would like to see us play some role in pushing it forward. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Sinead. Um, Rachel Wood. Or maybe that's from a previous. Sorry, that was from a previous one, but I, I think I'm probably all aware about my feelings of the need for RSE age appropriate and in schools and it to be across the board and on based, to, you know, on well, just that every every children a child and known person has access to um, facts rather than philosophy, or and you know, and, and just have an objective objective view of things. You know, and I think the more that we sort of say, oh, that's an education issue, and I'm not saying that we as a group, I'm talking about we as a society, that's an education issue, that's education. We're just continuing down this role of oh, that's you know, siloed mentality. You know, this is a justice issue. This is key for us in terms of looking at rehabilitation, about youth justice, about why children enter the, the justice system, about, you know, um, going into ACE is informed and trauma informed policy. You know, all of this kind of the, the relationship and sexual education all feeds into that. And, you know, I certainly know from my um, relatively recently, I'll say, experience of being in school, um, both primary and secondary, um, we got nothing. So that was unacceptable for me, apart from labelling diagrams, whereas my brother in a very different school system, you know, got a very different, um, di very different education. So I could talk for hours at length about the importance of RSE. I'm not going to, I'll save it, because I don't think we're all going to agree on it, but I do. Um, I do appreciate, um, certainly agree with, with Sinead's comments, you know, we would be going very far down the line before we would diverge. Um, and I'd certainly, yes, I appreciate that we can't come to a committee position on it, but um, it's certainly a, it's a massive issue that we need to actually consider whenever we're looking at legislation and policy. Yeah, no, thank you, Rachel. And I, 
I was at school much much earlier than you, and and I remember we did have an RSE, and and <laughs> I can remember I can remember mm-hmm. the teacher. I, I wouldn't want to embarrass her and name her, but it was an all boys class that she had to deliver all of these talks to. So you can just imagine, um, but uh, maybe you shouldn't imagine actually. So obviously, you know. And I think colleagues are right. There's probably a lot that we can agree to. The issue here is there's so much and in terms of the kind of levels of engagement and, and kind of policy consideration and discussion that you would need to have. The review team ultimately are, are leading on this. Um, you know, we have raised, I suppose, a committee position, albeit not in extensive detail, um, with the Education Minister, and I'm happy that we would forward that to to him. But I see Paul just catching my eye here, so let, let me bring Paul in. Yeah, I suppose if I could describe this as, as, be, as if everyone is thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. So it's OK to have a divergence of views on a lot of these things. But, but you know, we shouldn't, we sh- shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the Gillen Report actually uh, gives Board of Governors, school governors, their place. Uh, 87, the Department of Education should strongly encourage Boards of Governors to introduce awareness sessions to ensure students understand the consequences of posting on social media. So there is, there is that place given, and I think a lot of this stuff is clear-cut. And a lot of the stuff we can agree on as to you know what is a healthy relationship, and it's all about respect in many ways. But what I do know is this: if you have a if you have a pro forma or a, a, a scheduling of a curriculum, is it going to be effective in in the way we would like to think it would be? And I'm not sure because I'm not sure government is geared up for that. And I would also worry about where the civil service gets there material, uniform material from. All of that plays into it. And sometimes the Board of Governors of a school, along with parent groups, can can probably be the best place to actually effectively change mindsets. And one thing that we should also remember is this. When a child is put in that shock trauma situation, when they're having experiences that most of the other children won't be experiencing, a curriculum in a school ain't going to cut it. There's going to have to be a massive support around that child, uh, more so than the school or the teachers or a, a parent teachers association or a governors for that matter. It has to be a more all round approach, which doesn't just take in education and uh, and education and justice. It brings in health too. Uh, so there's a wider aspect here of how we surround that child to support it. And of course, support the whole family, including the victim and the perpetrator. So this is a much wider piece. But yeah, with regards to awareness, you know, what is a, a, a respectful and healthy relationship? I don't think any of us will disagree. It's probably how we implement that and what, what material is used is probably where we would get stuck on. Um, and I, I don't think it's for us uh, I think it is for education, but we have the wider piece to look at too with regards to children. I'll leave it there, Chair. Okay, thank you, Paul. Well, if, if members are content, we will send on to the review team um, the correspondence that we had with the Education Minister. I'm happy that we said to the review team you know, that it's something that they can come back to the committee where they see a justice strand to engage with the committee further on. And you know where there's a role, I'm more than happy that we feed into that where that's appropriate. Um, but if members are content, then we'll we'll take it forward on that basis. I don't have any other business in terms of chairman. Is there any other business for members under AOB? If not, then our next meeting will be at two o'clock, um, Senate Chamber, and through the Starley facility on Thursday, the 18th of February. Thank you, members. Sure. Yes, sorry, sure. Linda. Uh, apologies, just um, to put on record my thanks to Leanne and wish her the very best. And I'm sorry I couldn't hear you at the start to hear the name of our new member of staff. Um, but I look forward to meeting her, meeting her face to face, hopefully soon enough, sooner rather than later. And wish you the very best in your in your new role. But um, just to place on record, my thanks to Leanne. She's she's been excellent. I'm I'm genuinely sorry to see her go. Um, but I'm sure that. Our replacement will be equally as good, no doubt. Yeah. Okay. Well, th- thank, thank you, Linda. 
Um, thank you. Jim. Okay, Please. members. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. The Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.